All right. It is 4 p.m. on May 7th, 2024, and we're going to call the City of Iowa City work session into order. We have with us our Parks and Rec uh, commissioners, so welcome to each one of you. And I do want to just take a moment and just have you all introduce yourselves to the council and say something brief that you want to share. So we'll start over here. Okay. Um, my name is Rachel McPherson. I'm never brief, but I'll try. Um, I used to have a pet rat named Benny, and, and she was very smart. <laughs> I love it. Uh, my name is Alex Stanton. Uh, brief is I look, I look forward to working with you guys. Thanks awesome. for having us. Great. My name is Virginia Hayes. Um, I've lived in Iowa City since my kids were babies, and I've been bringing them to City Park Pool since they were babies, and we love City Park Pool. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Aaron Brogy. Um, I've lived in several cities, several states across the Midwest, and this is by far my favorite place I've ever lived. So thank you guys. <laughs> awesome. And we'll come over here. Caleb Raker. Uh, I've lived in Iowa City my whole life and have also used City Park. Uh, now married with three children, and hopefully they get to use the new City Park. Um, my name is Alex Hackman, so super grateful to be here and grateful for all the work that you do on our behalf as part of the City Council. Um, uh, the park that I most recently visited was Ryerson Wood, so with the beautiful weather, I encourage everyone to get out and enjoy the wonderful parks of Iowa City area. Great. Hey, I'm Connie Moore, and um, yeah, it's been super fun being on the commission, and I'm just super excited because it looks like Kate Martin is going to be on the <laughs> roster for the Aces. <laughs> uh, Brian Morelli, um, I've been in Iowa City for about 20 years, and my kids uh, were raised at City Park Pool, and we're lifeguards there, and um, just uh, really excited to be part of the process of looking forward. Well, I appreciate all of you being here today, and thanks for the work that you do. We're going to um, have uh, Parks and Rec Director come up at this time. So welcome, Julie Seidel Johnson. Thank you for having us. I'm so excited to see like all but one of our commission members here. Thank you for making time to come out early and be here today. Uh, just excited to move forward with City Park Pool and give you a lot of information in the next hour or so about the process we've been through and some recommendations. I'm going to take you through the first few slides and then turn it over to our um, consultant group. So just getting started, we're going to go through an introduction. We're going to talk briefly about the existing condition review, which you saw last summer, the council action that followed that. Go through our public input summary. We have had all kinds of public meetings, focus groups, online, um, all kinds of different ways for the public to get involved, and they really have been, so it's been an exciting process. We're going to talk through the four design concepts, talk about the op second open house that we had, and then the survey results, both the statistically valid random survey and our open survey that was available, and you'll get a recommendation action for action after that. And the goals are for you to helpfully understand the community input and the processes we went through to get all that input. I know that you've had a lot of residents contact you, uh, but we have information that shares, uh, kind of information from the entire community. We'll share that with you today. Then we'll hope for you to, at your next meeting, approve a new pool design concept, project budget, and then any other project considerations. So for the public and commission, tonight is not a night to make a decision on which of the four concepts to go forward with. Tonight is an information gathering, get all your questions answered, um, and move forward in about two weeks, hopefully with which one we go forward with. Our project team is led by Williams Architects, and they are joined by Barry Dunn, who had worked with us, both Williams actually and Barry Dunn worked with us on the Recreation Facility and Program Master Plan before this. And then we have University of Illinois here with our surveys. The project team sitting behind me, and he'll be up here in just a second, Frank Parisi and Andrew Caputo are our project architects. Danny Wilson has been our recreation consultant from Barry Dunn working on the public input side. And Laura Payne, as I mentioned, has been working with her graduate student or PhD students on the survey uh, methodology and results that you'll have reported to you. I want to take just a second to remind you of the project goals. These are the goals you've been working with since after the Recreation Facility and Program Master Plan. This is We use these even in hiring the consultants that will speak to you tonight. As we looked at the future of City Park Pool, these were the things that we 
felt were important that needed to be um, included in what, however we move forward. And you have seen these a couple times um, before this, but having a, providing a community recreation experience for a wide range of users. So we heard multi-generational throughout our focus groups and throughout our public input. People want a new pool that meets the needs of little kids all the way through seniors and everyone in between. Uh, increased independent accessibility. So right now you have the option of pool ladders, one set of stairs, and pool chairlift to get into the pool. We hope for a new pool that has ramps, have easy ways from the time you get out of your car to get through the bathhouse <coughs> and get into the pools in any, you know, in any number of ways so that's independent access into the pool. We've heard provide shade. Now you also hear provide space for sunbathing. So <laughs> the, we're looking for both here. Uh, operating efficiencies that support the climate action goals. And we'll talk about this with the gallons of water and, and kind of sizing, right sizing the pool because that all makes a difference down the road and how much, it, how much energy it takes to operate this pool. M maximize the efficiency of lifeguards. And I know you've had some public comments about one design or another taking more or less lifeguards, we can certainly answer those questions. Uh, we want to make sure that we have a pool that's flexible and can operate for the most people with the fewest number of lifeguards. Um, we're good for this summer, by the way, though. We have plenty of lifeguards, um, but we, we know that it's been difficult for a lot of the people around us. We want to promote our vision, every child learns how to swim. So once again, making the pool welcoming for families and non-swimmers, providing spaces, good spaces for swimming lesson instruction. And welcome users of all backgrounds with specific attention to the facility entry patterns. So when you come into City Park Pool right now, you come in the entrance, you have to immediately choose male or female locker rooms. You'll see a design tonight that gives you a third option to come straight through where we have single user restroom shower areas so that you have other ways to access the pool. If you're a family, a father coming with young, you know, your kids and you don't want to take them in the men's locker room or if you're a transgender individual or any, anybody else can use these single user areas as well. And we want to uh, evaluate the potential of merging the outdoor park restrooms and year-round recreation programming space. You'll see that that's been done in all of these pool designs. And generally keep the construction area within the fence. So we heard loud and clear, we like the way City Park feels, we like the tree line, we like the way the atmosphere out there. We think that all four concept designs will still offer that. You'll still feel like you're under a, a big canopy of trees. So those were the project goals we're going towards. We'll come back to those as we evaluate the four concepts later on. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to the project team and let them take you through the rest of the report. Welcome. Good afternoon. It's good to see all of you, see some familiar faces. Again, I'm Andrew Caputo with Williams Architects. Um, some of you might remember me from last summer, and I was here before the council presenting an existing conditions report for the existing city park pool. And we wanted to just briefly summarize that process for those of you that weren't um, available to attend that presentation and um, give you an overview of what we found and what we learned and what led to this process for exploring the planning for a new pool. So I'll just take you through that briefly through the next few slides. We were on site with our engineering team and we took a close look at the existing conditions. We gathered a lot of data from your staff and there were some things that we found um, that are summarized here on this slide. And one of the biggest things that we heard and learned and could observe is the tremendous water loss with the existing pool. Um, we, we learned that the pool was losing up to 55,000 gallons of water per day at the time. That was last summer. And that had been actually steadily increasing over the summers. Um, in fact, in 2022, the pool last lost over 5 million gallons of water. So going into this, we were already concerned and wanting to identify the causes for those water loss and understand if that could be solved. Um, we found a lot of deterioration um, based on the age of the structure in the pool basin. And we showed a lot of photos at our presentation. We just have a couple here, but we saw um, concrete basically that was just beginning to fail over time in the floor and the 
walls. That led us to a concern for structural integrity. We reviewed some old renovation drawings of the pool that have happened over the years, some changes to the existing gutters, and we found uh, a serious horizontal separation that's occurring at the gutter line of the pool wall that's leading uh, significantly to the water leakage. Uh, we looked at the existing conditions inside the bathhouse. Most of you are aware that the bathhouse has a basement pool equipment building. It's a confined space. Base. It would not be something that would be designed under today's codes, uh, so we expressed some concern about that. And we know all the details of the pool equipment, uh, such as the filtration systems, the, the sanitation systems, the surge tanks, all the piping. Those systems, of course, are aging over time and in need of replacement. We also considered operations and safety in our review. And after our review, we concluded um, based on our findings that repair of the pool did not make good economic sense. The magnitude of these difficulties that I previously mentioned were just too great, and we looked at a renovation cost of approximately around $10 million to renovate the existing pool to its to an acceptable condition that basically would continue to fail and only would be a temporary Band-Aid. And so with that, we recommended giving the community a chance to weigh in at this time and consider this to be a, a basically a wonderful opportunity to engage and say, hey, what is it that residents would like to see in a new pool? How could we design a new pool that supports all the residents um, uh, that someday would be um, regarded with the same love that this existing pool is. And with that uh, presentation, um, there was a, a council action, of course, and council voted to approve that recommendation. And mm -hmm. since that time, since I last saw you, we've been busy at work in this design process planning for a new pool. And that's what our presentation will continue to go through with you this afternoon. And with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Danny Wilson with Barry Dunn, and she's gonna talk about our public input, and then I'll be back with you to talk about the options. Okay. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Thank you. So glad to be here. You know, City Park Pool is such a beloved asset in this community, and I loved being able to help lead the charge in hearing what the community has to say and what the community thinks about what should happen with the future of City Park Pool. So we had a variety of in-person engagement opportunities that included some open house type feel activities, focus group meetings, and then that was the first step. And then the second step involved um, the conceptual design open house and a survey process that kind of worked together hand in hand. So the first open house was called an idea generation session, and that is because there was there's no preconceived notion as to what would be in a future city park pool, and that actually caught some of our participants off guard when they walked into the setting. Historically, they're used to seeing designs on a wall or designs on easels, and they get to pick which one they like the best. It wasn't time for that yet. At this stage of the game, it was a very creative process. We, en we enjoyed encouraging the community to join us in that design phase of like, well, let's think about, for example, with the buckets that you see there on the upper left-hand side, what would the style be of a future pool? What would what should we invest in as far as uh, amenities are concerned, or what types of pool spaces should be involved? You know, deep water, shallow water, etc. And by the way, what about accessibility? So on the bottom right-hand side, there you can see we had some. We did have boards up where we said, you know. This is a really important thing for us to know is accessing not only the water, but also the whole facility itself through the bathhouse is really important. Tell us what pieces of that are the most important to you. And you'll see the upper right hand side encourage folks to also be creative in their own way where they could draw or write or both on a big mural sheet of paper and let us know what they would envision the future of the pool to be. So this was an idea generation session where not only for those folks that could make it either to Mercer or Robert A. Lee, 
those that could not make it to either location had the same opportunity to give this similar type feedback online. So actually two ways to participate in the idea generation sessions. Additionally, we had 14 different focus groups. And those focus groups were, uh, there was an invitation put out to the entire community. Anyone could sign up to be a part of the focus group process. The, the submission requests it were, it was designed to be an intentionally inclusive process where the goal was to be as equitable as possible. So we asked folks to self-identify in a series of either demographic categories or user type categories so that then in a very transparent and open process, if there were more people interested than there were spots available in the focus groups, that there could be as equitable as a distribution within those focus groups as possible. So there was, there were, there's a larger group of folks that were interested in participating than we had spots available. And so what we did was offer those folks an opportunity to submit their answers to the very same questions that we were asking in person. And in the end, what that added up to was 566, six, sorry, feedback touch points is what we're calling them. So between the folks that were able to join us in person at the idea generation session, those that offered online feedback, those that participated in the focus groups, and also those that provided electronic fo focus group feedback, we had 566 different pieces of information to work with. So that is how we listened. And as far as who we heard from, we're hoping to convey here that on the upper left-hand side, the participants' race and ethnicity very much mirrored the race and eth ethnicity breakdown of the folks that live in Iowa City. Some similar results from a gender perspective, and you'll see that from an age perspective, the largest participant group were ages 30 to 49 years. That's that green bar that you see on the, the left of the participant age chart. We wanted to show that we, we did have over 157 folks that identified as being over 50. And there was one woman who walked out of our idea generation session who I just, I loved, I had to write it down, her quote. She said, I'm 67 and I had fun. And that's what we wanted it to be. City Park Pool is a fun place to be. It's a gathering space. So we wanted to uh, highlight the fact that folks had a good time participating in this process. As far as what we heard during this phase of community engagement, it was loud and clear that community members wanted a preservation of the history, the trees, and the open feel of the current city park pool. There was also a desire for future development of the pool to focus on learn to swim, so very much in line with the goals of the project. Multi-generational was brought up uh, throughout the feedback we heard. And then safety was also important to the participants. And safety meant different things to different people. For the parents of young children, safety meant that they could see all ages of children all across the whole pool deck. Whereas then safety from someone who might not identify male or female, they wanted to feel safe in the space. The lifeguard team also, when we talked with them, they wanted to be able to keep the place safe as, as much as possible. So safety definitely rose to the top from a thematic perspective as a consideration in the potential designs. And then finally, what we also heard was, please avoid overlapping functions. What that meant is the lap swimmers trying to swim laps while the teenagers are trying to throw the football. Sometimes those things just didn't mingle very well. It's not that they either party didn't like the other activity happening, just that the overlapping functions made it difficult in certain places in the current layout of the city park pool. As far as amenities are concerned, the top amenity that we heard about was shade. And that was through nearly every single focus group and throughout all of the comments. It didn't matter if it was shade from trees, shade over the pool deck, or shade over the, over the water. Loud and clear, shade rose to the top. Similarly, lap lanes. 
And we will mention both 50 meter and 25 yard lap lane lengths were important to people for different reasons. The 25 yard requests rose to the top often due to their ability in that there were folks that said, you know what, I would like from a progressive, sorry, progression perspective that learn to swim, we need to have the shorter length before we go to a long course length. That was one perspective. Another was physically, this per person's example was, I have asthma. I need to be able to stop at 25 yards. So we heard that it, alongside the folks that also wanted 50 meters for their long course training needs. <coughs> The diving boards are beloved, so we wanted to make sure we shared that with you, that that was another top amenity, followed by an overall acknowledgement that an expanded kids area, particularly for ages three to eight years old, was determined as, yeah, the, it's missing currently. So there was an acknowledgement from really all sorts of user groups that that was something that we could do better on with future developments. Some of the other support features you'll see there at the bottom, the bubblers and jets, not only would that appeal to younger, littler children, but also from a sensory perspective. That was important to some of our participants' needs. Splash pad and seating in the water. There's a social location. When we think about pool entry and accessibility, loud and clear we heard zero depth, en zero depth entry was the most important way for folks to be able to enter. All ages, all abilities, over and over and over again we heard zero depth entry followed by sloped entry, and then we didn't ask specifically about railings, but that was something that came out of our conversations with folks is they really wanted a railing to hold on to, to be able to get it in and out of the pool. Finally, at this stage of our engagement, we asked about the bathhouse. So, spe so specifically to the locker room and changing room area, folks wanted non-gendered and gendered options. It was important to folks who wanted to be able to not have to pick or choose, male, female, as Julie mentioned, but also those folks that absolutely wanted to choose male or female. Something to keep in mind as we have our design options later. Family and group spaces were also very important, followed by privacy. Privacy rose to the top for sure as something that was more desired in future bathhouse designs. The user experience we found that the people wanted direct access into the pool. Regardless of having to choose male, female, people just want to get in. They want it, they're excited, they want to get through, and they don't want, ha want to have to go through a bunch of hoops to be able to get to that water. Support features also came out of this process. Little did we know that those hooks, the seats, the suit spinners are important added features to the community. When we asked about the multi-purpose room, there was a lot of um, just, okay, yeah, that sounds great. However, the sentiment was, so we'll support it so long as it does not interfere with any other of the pool features that I just told you about. Uh, so so they, they wanted to support the, the multi-purpose room as, and they saw a lot of different opportunities of use for that space so long as it didn't interrupt the, the rest of the pool design, which we as the consulting team knew, they're very separate in their design and there is no impact um, on the rest of the pool. And with that, we learned all of these great things that fed into the design concepts. Hello again, everyone. Just wanted to make sure to mention, feel free to ask any questions along the way here as, if, if you would like to, um, or certainly you could save them for the end, but we'd be happy to answer any questions as we go along here. Uh, the next uh, chapter in our presentation is to discuss the design concepts that uh, we prepared, and we'll take you through that process. As we look at the design concepts that we created, um, the, a chart was made of comparison factors. There were four 
specific design concepts that we shared with the community. And you can see those in different colors at the top. We're gonna look at this chart as we move through um, the presentation tonight and each one of the concepts with the data filled in. <laughs> On the left-hand side in blue are various criteria. Just reading a few costs, bather load, water savings, program areas, and these criteria could be compared between the different options. This chart was just a useful tool to get a snapshot to look at the similarities and the differences. All right. All right. Um, option A was the first concept that we created. And before we talk about option A, I wanted to just mention some global um, uh, thoughts, and that is to develop options uh, after the community input uh, information was really an exciting time for us, especially as architects. Um, the, the creativity and the challenges associated with trying to, to, to build outdoor recreation spaces and programming these aquatic elements is what we do. Um, while we're gonna share four concepts with you tonight, and those were the four concepts that we ultimately decided were the best, we actually explored probably 15 to 20 different concepts and vetted those in our office as a team discussing which ones best address the project goals and also the goals of the community. And so these four options I'm gonna walk you through, they have some general similarities and I wanted to just spend a little bit more time on option A to explain those similar things first that you'll see repeated in all the options. And one of the most important things as Danny mentioned that um, you'll see in all the concepts was this notion and love for this place, this place which is City Park and the setting. So the setting was a very important thing to all of us throughout all these concepts. We tried to work very carefully to organize the design of all these concepts in a similar fashion so that the footprint and the integrity of the space between the existing trees was maintained. We tried to be very careful to cite the major elements, the bathhouse, the, the pool elements and the separate filter building within that, within that footprint, and you'll see that repeated. So on this drawing, north is up. You'll see a similar sized bathhouse. The bathhouse is the same design in all the options. I'll show you that at the end after we get through the four different options. We are separating the filter building from the bathhouse. Um, to address some of the concerns with operations and safety and also reducing costs by getting the filter building is actually less expensive, closer to the deeper water than it is now where it's on the north and associated with the shallow water. Um, so you'll see some similarities there. And also another thing that you'll see uh, Danny mentioned a lot of feedback that we, we received about shade. So you'll see all of these options have various shade structures. Um, there's some different shapes and different geometries. Some are over the, the pool deck, some are over uh, grass areas or, or over the water, but you'll see that similarity. Um, what, uh, what led us to option A and all of the options was trying to synthesize these comments that we heard. And a lot of the feedback that we received uh, really emphasize the beauty of City Park and its simplicity and the idea of just the experience of open water in this wonderful setting. And we received a lot of commentary from residents that this is not a, a water park. So the idea of open water, we thought about that. And then we know that City Park Pool is very important for lap swimming. And so the idea that um, uh, open water and lap swimming uh, really led us to a, a shared um, feature that all of these options have, and that is the 650 meter lap lanes. Um, we know that the lap, that size of, of um, a pool can provide um, just the general open swim that's desired, uncluttered for various activities for kids, for learn to swim, for just general program, for having fun. Um, and then also at times the pool can be used for either long course or at various role planks for, for shorter course distances. Um, can, I, can I ask a question real quick? Of course. Um, so in that, mm -hmm. uh, in the drawing, and you mentioned for some things it could be 
25, is that because there will be a bulkhead? There could be a bulkhead. That is, that is, that is a possibility. In the drawing, it, we just have a, basically a rope divider that separates what would be two 25-meter um, sections between the 50-meter pool. However, yes, there could be a movable bulkhead. There could, if the bulkhead is deployed, it would be something that would need to be lifted, mm -hmm. and then the pool actually would be just a little bit longer than 50 meters, and then the bulkhead would need to be stowed mm -hmm. um, and basically lifted and then anchored at the end of the pool. So that is a consideration. It yeah. could, there could be a bulkhead. So either way, though, it would be, in terms of lap swimmers, it would be either a 25, like, I'm thinking of, um, it would be either 50, or 25, regardless of the, Correct. the, the rope or the bulk. Head, Correct. Right? Considering um, some of um, the other challenges that we had when we were looking at City Park Pool, um, we know that that pool was designed at a different time when it was the only pool in the community, mm -hmm. besides the original uh, University of Iowa pool. Um, and it, it was, it was, uh, it is certainly an enormous body of water. And so we knew going into that that to replicate that size would be very expensive. However, you'll see that here as one of the options. Um, so what we wanted to do uh, here was um, if we are separating overlapping uses, which is again a comment that we heard very frequently, and we moved diving out of the lap swimming, which we've done here and created a separate diving hopper, so now we don't have divers splashing on lap swimmers, and, and they're in a completely separate body of water. And then we also want to respond to the idea of this expanded play, that uh, play area for kids, because the existing pool has that small waiting area. There is no zero depth entry. Zero depth was very desired. So we separated and have a zero to about three foot six area. So there is a nice separate waiting area here. So the thought process was, also understanding the budget, the city's climate action goals, the enormous amount of gallons in the existing pool is, again, trying to balance all these factors as architects. We, we started with, hey, this is for a, a, at least a minimum of six lanes could potentially serve the needs for lap swimming and for open swim and learn to swim. And the thought process behind that was just simply that these lanes would be available um, for longer periods than they currently are, even though there's currently more lanes, because we've separated these, these uses. So the, the lap lanes would actually be available for longer during the day. Now, there, we, we'll talk later about there are opportunities to make all of these options larger and have additional lanes, which we'll talk about later. But this is basically how we came up with these four concepts, was to try to balance those factors and not run away too far um, with, with the budgets. But if I might just finish um, uh, talking before we go on to um, uh, the next option, I'll just finish a few things here for option A. Uh, option um, A was perhaps the most organic, uh, so you could see the geometry of the kids' area is a, is a little bit more of a playful, freeform shape, um, but not a water park. Still a very large open area with some small bubblers or geyser, geysers at the zero depth entry. Um, again, I mentioned it would it would go from zero to three foot six deep. The um, 50 meter pool. Um, another way to look at the city's climate action goals and reducing water usage, not just operations, but pulling that diving, that deep pool and that diving pool out means that that's the only area that we need to be super deep at that 13 or 14 feet deep. And so the entire 50 meters doesn't need to start sloping to make it down to 13 feet deep. So this pool can be designed now between three foot six to say five feet deep or six feet deep. Um, and it can be more of a um, semi shallow water. And again, that contributes to um, water efficiency. Another just consideration that we had with, with, um, with the design. This pool also, and you'll see a similar theme to have accessible features. So we have 
not just the zero depth, but we have an accessible pool stair um, into the lap pool. And then we actually also have a pool stair into the deep pool, which is kind of a nice feature. There's a three foot six deep landing at the end that you can step down and then step off into the deeper water. That is nice for programming, not just for diving, but actually other activities that might happen in the deep hopper like water aerobics. Um, with each design, you'll see at the bottom here, and I'm not going to go through every one of these bullet points, but we wanted to just comment on the designs, compare it to the existing pool so that you could understand the differences. So this particular design is about 500,000 gallons of water, and it's about 34% less water than the current pool. So still a very large pool. That's a little bit less than 1,000 for the bather load. And each one of these pools has a cost estimate. When we say cost, this is total project cost. Um, the, the, the total project cost is um, 18.39 million for this particular pool, and the, the, the cost is the um, construction cost and the soft cost as well, and includes a contingency. So when we say when we say cost, it's not just construction cost. That's the total project cost. If anyone has any questions about that, you can ask us. Super quick. I'm sorry. I think you did mention it. Uh, What's the current? Should I go back? Let me know no, if I no, need no, to No, 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 no. Just, yeah. it's super yeah. quick. Um, what was the, what's the current uh, bather load? For the, for uh, the current bather load is, um, uh, it's, it's actually option D is very similar oh, to the okay. existing design, sorry. so it's like a little bit over 1,000. Okay, it, I'll find it. But we'll get there in just a minute, yeah. Andrew, um, one, uh, one other point. Yeah, if, sure. When you go through each option, <laughs> would you point out if there are any specific lifeguarding needs for that design? Yes. Thank you. So um, this this just populates very slowly, so I'm sorry for that. I don't know why that does that, but I, I don't want to make sure I, I lose it. Um, so I won't. I would not be able to specifically comment exactly according to the number of lifeguards for each, each option because there's there are variables and it depends on what whether you're at the maximum bather load, at three quarters bather load or half bather load, how many people are using the pool, and and um, exactly what the operations are, what's happening during. You know, are you doing just are you doing learn to swim? So the the actual number of lifeguards. I would actually defer to Julie to help me a little bit with commenting on scenarios for each one of these, comparatively speaking. Um, honing in on the exact number of lifeguards will happen later in on the design process. But we did recognize and want, as Danny mentioned, uh, safeguarding and lifeguarding to be a primary consideration with all of these options. So you'll see in particular that the bathhouse is designed very differently than the existing bathhouse when we get to it for supervision. One of the comments we received, negative comments, about City Park Pool was a lot of parents didn't like how when they were with their very young children in the waiting pool area, they felt like they were very removed from what was happening in the larger pool just because it's turned and the orientation of it and the distance. So not only lifeguarding, but just general safety and the idea that um, all guards would have a visual across the entire pool was a strong consideration in all these options. So this is going to populate slowly. And again, I won't read all these to you, but I just wanted you to see that these are, this just was a very nice tool. Um, it's, it's just loading here. And this first one will just populate all the different, um, some will be a check mark, some will be an X, and there'll be some data. We'll look at the end where they'll all be together. There they go. And then we're going to move to option B. And it'll just delay for a minute. Whoops. Sorry about that. Okay, option B was an interesting uh, variation. Option B is unique in all the options um, in that it has three separate bodies of water. This was uh, interesting to explore because it presents some programming and operational considerations that some folks um, thought were uh, strong positives as we reviewed this uh, and discussed this. and. 
it was a nice design also, not just with operations, but it was a nice design to also think about perhaps different water temperatures. Um, we did receive comments about lap swimmers liking cool water, and so this, uh, this is a way that you, you, you don't share uh, water temperature with, with these separate pools because each pool would have its own filtration system. Um, there's a little bit of uh, uh, cost involved in that. As you might imagine, when you separate all the different pools and each one has its own systems, you have a little bit more cost to, to do that generally, and how we offset that was just to make the water areas a little bit smaller. Um, so you'll see in this, uh, this option is, is close to the cost of option A uh, at, at $17.94 million, but this pool has an activity pool at the northernmost pool, the zero depth, which is always associated with the adjacency to the locker room. We always want the shallowest water to be close to where the kids are coming right out of the bathhouse for safety. And then the pool gets deeper. This pool would be designed to be about four feet deep. And then we have two accessible pool stairs on either side. If you could see my cursor, a play structure and uh, uh, some shade. This pool has that similar deep hopper that you saw before from option A, it's just rotated. So it also has the same opportunity for one meter and three meter diving, also about 12 and a half to 13 feet deep. And it has a similar 50 meter pool, six lanes in this option. Um, in this option, uh, just to vary it up a little bit, we, we put a pool stair and we put a sloped entry ramp on this option. Um, any of the options could have the sloped entry ramp and or pool stair or both, but we just drew some different just to have a little slight differentiation. Again, you'll see the same uh, filter building to the south positioned a little bit differently. Okay. So their operational considerations for separate pools are, are interesting because you can close a pool, you could have a, a certain activity happening at a pool while the rest of the pools are open to public, you could have a certain camp using a certain pool, you could have um, you know, a team using uh, the lap swimming and, and you could close down a pool for maintenance and have the other ones open. Um, some of the negatives um, of separate pools are they can be a little bit more difficult for lifeguarding at times. Uh, one of the things that, you know, guards just have to police are kids running across the deck between the different bodies of water. So they do have, they do have some cons, but like all, like anything, there are, there are pros and cons. And the most interesting thing about this option is again, achieving those different um, uh, non-overlapping uses in another way than option A. On the topic of temperature regulation, I'm curious about the you know, reduction in the quantity of water and also where, you know, if you're losing, f what, 5 million gallons a year, um, are these pools going to be warmer? And then what is built into these designs to temper the water? Yes, that's a great question. So in the budgets that we're currently carrying for all the designs, uh, so we're just estimating the, the most expensive case in case that would be the ultimate direction. All the budgets include completely heating all the bodies of water and all the pools um, that they would all have the ability to be heated. Um, that decision doesn't need, I mean, it, it could be made at the council level, but it doesn't need to be. Um, it, it, is, it, is, it is included in the budget because, um, again, it's better to include it than not include it and then later want to add it and it increases the cost. But you, you do have the ability um, when you have um, a heated pool to address one of the project goals about learn to swim perhaps a little better than the existing pool. So temperature can be something that's um, regarded very differently between your different user groups, right? Because young families and children, they want warm water. You know, my kids were blue when they were little coming out of the pool taking swimming lessons, you know, and so to, you know, warm water encourages young children to love the water. On the other hand, there's a cost to heat the water and lap swimmers conversely like cooler water. So when you, when you combine these bodies of water, you end up having to reach a compromise temperature between these various user groups. You can always also, of course, choose to only heat in 
the end of May and June and then not run the heaters the entire year afterwards. So you, you have um, flexibility. Let me just say that the temperature conversation is an ongoing conversation that we expect to have throughout the design process with whatever these op whatever uh, entails these options. With, with heating, how far can the season extend? Um, the season, I mean, it, it would be, it's more of a lifeguard issue that we find with, if, yes, you're right, you could extend the heating, um, you could extend, by heating the pool, you probably could operate farther into September. Um, but most of our clients find that the limiting factor is not so much that they can't keep the water warm and comfortable as that they end up losing so many of their staff back going back to school. Um, so, so that's usually, usually dictates most municipal or park district outdoor pool operations is because they lose such a significant staff. But your question is, you know, theoretically correct. You could, you could leave the pool open longer at, you know, at heated. Sure. I have a question too. Um, you talked about the volume of water and how much we're gonna save if we went with this design comparing with the old design. Uh, can you just tell me, uh, I, I don't know, I don't find it nowhere, how big is the, like, how, how the difference in size between the current bowl and the old bowl? Size-wise, like volume of the waters. Oh, so um, actually, that's an excellent question. So the this design here, as you could see, and, and I'll move the cursor. You can see it. This one is about 458 thousand gallons of water. You'll see when we go to option D, the last one, which is actually very similar yes. to the existing, and it'll show you that the <laughs> gallons of water, I believe, we'll get to it. I think it's 750 thousand. No, okay. it's 750 thousand oh, gallons. Oh, 750. So it's it's very significant. Um, I can't remember if it's 775 or 750. 771. But, but we'll get to it in, a, in a, just a couple of minutes. But sure. that's an excellent question mm -hmm. because the, the water is tremendous. Mm -hmm. Yes? Existing city park, I'm sorry. Yeah. You, you're going to have to come Oh, to the I mic. had it right there. I oh. didn't realize it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Thanks. I, I remembered yeah. it from Thanks. options. Yeah, 751. Yeah. Thank you, Frank. I have a question. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, here. Yeah. Uh, how do you come up with the bather load, and then how's that distributed across, like the, the yeah? Pool so surface? the bather the bather load is is interesting. It's based on the number of people that the code, the Iowa Swimming Pool Code, says can be in shallow water or deep water, at the same time, the maximum allowed, and then also on the pool deck, and so you have different um, factors that you use to calculate that value. And you add those two together. Um, there's also um, exceptions that you deduct. So for example, if you have a, a pool that's um, you know, 2,000 uh, square feet and, and, and you have, a, have a diving boards, you take out the plunge area because it's assumed that you can't have bathers while you have plunge areas. So for each one of these pools in our um, drawing software, we, we can calculate the area of the water and then we can use the code dictated dividers. You know, we know whether the water is, five, water is divided by five feet. So anything five feet and less is considered shallow water and deeper than five feet is considered deep water. And so again, the code has different values that you use. There's more people that you can fit in shallow water than in, than in deep water. And there's a different, um, a different factor for the pool deck. And that's why all of these have a little bit different number because the geometry of the design is a little different. And so this one is 881. Yeah, again, yep. uh, when, when you're saying the 750 and the 458, uh, when, when you say the 458 right now, do you consider only one bowl or all three of them? All three. All three? All three together. Okay. Yeah, the total design. When it relates to bather load, can we have some context of like what's kind of the maximum bather load we have right now? Yep. You're posted. What is the posted bather yeah. load right so now? So our bather load right now is a little over a thousand. Um, a really busy day right now gets 500 people throughout the entire day. We had that twice last summer. Um, usually it's more like two or three hundred people per day throughout the entire day at the pool right now. So you're well, you're well above any 
current beta load that we would ever that we've seen probably in the last decade. One thing that I just thought of to help answer the question about the bather load that if I just might point out for a minute, something to think about the bather load isn't so much as like how many people would normally be there. You, you regard it as almost the same thing as like in a building. Like this room would, according to the fire department, according to the International Building Code, it would have a maximum occupancy. Like our meeting tonight is not near that maximum occupancy. It would be an enormous number. Whoops, you know, the, the number in this room might be like, there, it says 95, you know, 95 people, right? You probably rarely have 95 people, but you could. So that's kind of like how the Baver load is regarded. <laughs> Are you laughing because I haven't been to enough Iowa City meetings? Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should come back more, right? I'm just gonna add numbers, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's, is the bather load directly proportional then to the bathhouse, and is that baked into all of these, or is or did you use the same bather house for all the designs? So we designed the bathhouse and all of these options to be about a thousand to accommodate about a thousand bathers. And what's what's uh, interesting about the code is that the code doesn't have the same like delineations. So what I mean by that is the bather load controls the minimum number of fixtures. So like, you need to have so many labs, you need to have so many showers, you need to have so many toilets based on the, the bather load. But the increments are large, like huge increments, yep. like 500 to 1,000 bathers in the code requires this many fixtures. So it doesn't matter if you're 501 or you're 999, for example, your bathhouse is the same size. Okay. So that's why you'll see in all the designs, the bathhouse is unchanged because it's basically saying we're meeting that minimum fixture range that's in the code up to 1,000 bathers or okay. approximately 1,000 bathers. I'm sorry to hop in on this. It's okay. But I'm wondering and I'm hoping that this is the appropriate time and if it you're like I get to it or or whatever but since you're on option B one of the things I'm curious about and I don't it wouldn't be bather load <clears throat> but I think maybe I don't know not cubic feet either but area mm -hmm. of the zero depth and the bench right it's saying that's option A as well as then zero depth and so like the hangout pool essentially right uh, between a and b are they roughly the same size so, so they, it, I, and how do we measure that is that by cubic feet is that by area so it can be it both ways because again it, the 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 size of the pool is yes you can consider square fo the, the square footage but it right. also depth is a factor so this pool option a has a has a lot has just again just because they're all the designs are all just a little bit different this pool uh, slopes from zero to about three foot six deep mm -hmm. at this um, rope mm -hmm. and this is a little bit longer um, zero depth just because of the nature of its fan shape whereas and, and again I'm sorry to go okay. back because now you're gonna have, have to watch it load <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sorry well, for making you do that too. again no 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 you're <laughs> um, uh, but option B is is a little bit narrower, um, right. a zero depth. Now we have all these dimensions available to us because okay. we designed all these. Mm -hmm. I just don't have the the exact dimensions of the pool all memorized. I think this zero depth was about 40 to 50 feet wide, mm -hmm. if I if I remember right. Um, but I. Don't quote me on that. I would have to get back to you, so I would have to open up my CAD yeah. software and query it. Yeah. So I could get you all the lengths of the zero depth information after this meeting. Okay. Yeah. And then it'll populate um, option B. We'll, we'll skip through that. Uh, unfortunately, I can't. Um, I, I have to let it populate before I can go to the next one. Okay, option C. Uh, option C it was created, um, one of the things that was that is neat about the existing facility is the T-shape. A, a lot of people um, commented uh, just how much they thought the simplicity of the existing geometry was a wonderful thing just for operations and and uh, the, the, uh, the concept of having shallower water uh, that sloped uh, uh, gently down to about three or four feet deep and then to the deep end. So basically, um, we discussed 
discussed about the gallons, and we know that that T-shape is a lot of water volume. So what we did here, um, because we had people ask us, well, why, why can't you just put two zero depth entry edges on the current city park pool instead of having the, you know, one foot nine or one foot six depth? And we could, but that would be very expensive because as you might imagine, it's expensive to create zero depth. So all we did with this option was we took a T and we made it an L. So basically, we just put the shallow and the shallow water on one side. So it's very similar to the existing design that way. Instead of a T, it's an L shape. Um, there's a there's a, a little bit of a cost efficiency here because again, you're sharing filtration systems with the activity pool and the lap pool. You see again here the six lanes. 50 meters uh, that would also be dividable. This option includes a play feature and some geysers um, in the pool for kids and it also has that separate deep hopper that's rotated um, on the opposite side of the pool. So there's some interesting th things that happen here with, with, um, with option C. Again, different, different than option A, different than option B. Can I ask, I'm sorry, and this might be a question for Julie, um, with, exist, with the existing pool and the diving well, are there any clubs or any, um, you know, competitive divers that use it? Because the notion of a 12 and a half to 13 feet depth, mm -hmm. unless that's more on the recreational side where people yeah. are not trying to, we don't it just any, seems like that's very have, shallow. Yeah, we don't have competition. Okay. And what is the depth of our current pool? It's 14, 14 right now. So right, I was just going to say, I mean, I just, yeah. So yeah. that's it. That's all I wanted. I don't yeah. Yeah. want to prolong and, it. And at, at this point of the project, because we're so preliminary, a mm -hmm. foot in depth doesn't matter. So okay. if the deep pool is 14 feet and it's 13 feet, it's, a, it's relatively speaking the contingencies factor. So it doesn't, yeah, it, no. it's it was, a, it's it the exact like depth can be decided. Yeah, if it was sort of yeah. like that 12, 12 and a half, mm -hmm. first, anyway. Yeah. It, it, if, if this pool is desired to be 14 feet deep, it can be, yeah. And then we'll watch that populate again. We didn't know that that would queue up so long like that. Okay, option D. Option D, um, because we did receive uh, feedback from many in the community, not everyone, but many in the community, particularly the lap swimming groups that said, hey, we really like the existing pool, can't you just replicate the existing pool? And as we considered the design options, we thought, well, surely we could create an option and then that option can be sent to the community at large and we can see if that sediment is shared amongst the majority of the community. So it seemed reasonable um, for us as an approach to basically show essentially replicating the existing pool. Now, we would have to make some minor changes to it to comply with current codes, such as adding a, a, a pool stair but there, and other minor manipulations. But basically, we could duplicate the footprint, generally duplicate the depths, and have a pool, but without the desired zero depth entry or expanded children's area. So this is essentially replacing the pool um, in kind with a very, very similar structure. And again, the idea here was that because we did receive some feedback in our, in our um, uh, visits with the public, we thought, well, that's great. Why don't we just have this option and send this out to the community at large and see um, how the community at large reacts to the option. So you could see that this is the most expensive option. And that's, again, just due to the fact that the pool is, is quite large. So this option is almost $20 million. And you could see, again, that bather load, just about around 1,000. Two pool questions before sure. we get to the bathhouse. Um, number one, I, I don't know with pools if um, adaptability, is, and by that I mean additions, like adding additional lanes in the future, is that all feasible? Um, I know that there's a people who just want more lanes. We have people who want more lanes, and it's obviously just a matter of cost. And is that an option, or is that pretty poor um, I don't want execution to say for? A pool? I don't want to say like it's. I, there, there, you might find somewhere in the country where a pool was added to, but I would say it would be extremely rare. The, and there'd be two reasons for that. Um, the, it's not. It wouldn't be difficult to demolish a wall of the pool and, and extend it, but the difference is you, you've created an enormous um, seam that then you would have to engineer to be 
completely watertight, which might be over time difficult to maintain the water tightness of that enormous joint all the way through the pool. And then the other problem is, is that all of the pool piping, the return piping and the supply piping, that would all need to be completely re-engineered based on how you're expanding the pool based on the Iowa code. So you can't just um, like extend the pool and extend the gutter without completely redoing all of your piping and filtration equipment because you've changed the gallons of water and the flows through all of that sure. piping. Okay, so bad idea. Yeah. Do it right no, the first time. There's no bad ideas. No, there's no, no bad, idea. bad idea. I'll own that. Um, I, uh, I am curious, though, about if any of these options are ones that um, have more or less durability or longevity in the design, or they're all equal in no, that. No, they, they all would have equal longevity. Which is they, what? They would all have... What is, the, what is the project? Yeah. Well, that that can it depends a lot on operations and maintenance, right? Okay. And it, again, it ultimately depends what materials the pools are made out of. Like any other decision with specifying construction products, there's a good, better, best, right? Mm -hmm. Just like buying a, a car. Um, but I would say that we we typically would design or recommend that you allow us to specify materials for you to achieve a minimum 35 years life expectancy without a renovation um, and and um, you you should be able to get at least 50 years out of the pool but you will need or you will need renovation yeah yeah I guess to just to mm -hmm. uh, guess most question about adding lanes later why not now adding two lane and make it like bigger. Is this like cost-wise or area is We not are going to talk about that exact thing later in the presentation. That you that is just excellent comment because okay. the, the all of these options were just ones that we came up with to try to balance these factors to not get over that twenty million dollar mark or too close to it. So you'll see um, later at the end of our presentation, um, Frank is going to talk about some ex some additional considerations of feedback that we heard. And I, without jumping too far ahead any of these options can be revised from six to eight lanes uh, eight, for additional cost. Um, and in fact, there's, a, there's also ways that we can accommodate short course uh, 25 yards, what Frank will talk about as well. So these are some considerations for tweaking the option just a little bit should you choose to do that. Couldn't get like get six, get the seventh free? That's right. That's right. You'll have to. We're the architects. You have to talk to the contractors about that. Uh, I'll go for uh, it. Yeah. Um, lastly, I wanted to just briefly talk about the bathhouse plan and the bathhouse design. Um, Julie and Danny mentioned a little bit about this, and again, I won't spend too much time on this, but just again, to emphasize uh, with you that that existing bathhouse has has outlived its life expectancy just like the pool. And we want, again, to get safety and the public separated from all the filtration systems and get those systems down closer to the deeper water on the south end of the building. So the new building would only be one story. Um, we would redesign the way that you move through the bathhouse. So instead of being forced to go through either the men's or women's locker room in this design, you would come through. This is north. You could enter the bathhouse um, in either door, and you would be able to move through the bathhouse locker rooms directly onto the pool deck. That's that yellow area, the lobby space. We'd have an admissions area out front. The current design, there's a lack of security because staff is just literally out in the lobby with the corridor space and they don't have a lot of um, uh, protection from things and money and information that they might be handling from, page, uh, from patrons. So this separates um, the admissions and puts staff in a separate area that's right in front and center, and they can uh, see and admit and control who's coming in uh, to the facility. Um, this uh, light um, pink area are the single user washrooms. There would be two of them. Each one would have a, a shower and a toilet and a lab and then a, a nice big bench um, and be fully accessible. And then we would have a, a, a mom's nursing room here um, that could also just double as a, as a dry uh, changing room. 
And again, that could be used for anyone. And moving through the um, back of the building there, we would redesign the entire guard area and pool manager area. Um, one of the negatives we saw, we, we design a lot of uh, pools in our office, uh, that's our, our specialty. Uh, and we see that when we're in the bathhouse uh, city park pool, we do not have a good visual looking out uh, of the back um, area. There isn't good supervision to see all the activity that's happening. So that's why the pool manager is designed like a bay window, like a box bay, and it sticks out so that it would have all windows. And so not only do you have your guards where they should be on the deck, on the decks uh, supervising, but you also have the ability for having your guards and staff in the building, and they are constantly seeing their own guards in the public and where there might be an incident. Um, we also want to improve the guard area, the facilities for your existing staff at City Park Pool, again, was designed at a time that is now passed, so we want to improve that. There's a dedicated first aid room, which is also something that's missing, um, a place for someone might, who might be overheated to cool down, uh, somebody that might you know, have an injury, a place for them to be and be up away and off the pool deck and feel safe and separated um, until they could get some help. Uh, then we have a, a guard washroom and some, some um, storage areas and lockers. Each one of the um, gendered locker rooms are similar. Uh, privacy, again, Danny talked about this, a huge thing about um, design nowadays. Um, there's no such thing as open showers anymore, open dressing areas. So the bathhouse, you would move through this. Um, we'd have a, a series of our um, uh, uh, toilets here as you walk in from the from the uh, from the lobby then we would have a, a dressing area that would have an uh, open bench but then there would be individual dressing compartments with seats inside and then showers that all have individual dressing compartments with with curtains and again you can move through the pool deck and then lastly the community room community room is a seasonal room um, so this room can be used at any time so the idea was that it would have doors. You could use this for birthday party rentals, for example. You might have a pool party um, in the off season. The pool's closed. These doors could be locked, but these doors could be open, and this could be used by camps that are using the park. And that might be a nice feature. Uh, this room also would just be a nice thing to have just in general as another program room for the parks department at large, because this is a nice size meeting room that they could have and program meetings here during the day when other facilities elsewhere might be used or unavailable. Uh, so there's, and then also any programming uses or classes could be held here as well. Lifeguard training, for example. Uh, lastly, we have some exterior washrooms here that would be used by the um, uh, people using the park. So these actually, these pink washrooms, they're outside of the enclosure, outside of the fence. Is the presumption that this building is a year-round building then? If you um, the building itself could be year-round. Um, we've designed this, and again, we'll get into more. This is very preliminary. Um, we would recommend tempering the bathhouse, which is how we recommend and actually do design most of them, which is we mean not allowing the buildings to freeze and having at least minimal heat so you can keep everything at 55 degrees. It makes the buildings last longer. Um, because you are already providing those minimal systems for heating, there's barely any additional cost to make it so you can heat them to 70 degrees um, if you should you choose to use them. Um, but again, we can have more conversations about that and what the intent is and how you might use all or parts of the building. Today, oftentimes staff spaces have their have separate cooling, not the entire bathhouse, but that is also um, uh, considered now. Um, but specifically, at a minimum, we talked about this end of the building being all seasons. Andrew, a question with storage. Mm -hmm. There's not much storage in there. No, that, that, that's a drawing, good question. Yeah. And especially <clears throat> the community room, I think, will provide good flexibility for programming. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like it's outfitted kind of similar to, say, what Mercer has right now. Um, I'm just wondering if maybe there, it's possible to 
grab some of the space within the janitorial or custodial space absolutely and repurpose that otherwise yeah i think the community room may end up serving as storage or the garden mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a good comment and i appreciate that and we certainly can add more storage and improve the design we we um, are showing you a preliminary plan here so realize that everything will go through a thorough analysis of the pros and cons and this is just very preliminary so we'll make a mental note of that um, but your comment of storage is excellent so we do want to provide storage generally for things that are on the pool deck seasonally and it's not we don't show a big storage room with this because when we design separate building filter buildings we usually put that big storage room with the filter building um, and so that will have all the pool equipment and then it'll have a storage room where you can put the rope reels and the lounge chairs and, and, and things that you want to get off the pool deck um, so, um, I, don't, I mean, they, they could be in the bathhouse if you if you desired. We could have a separate storage room like that. But usually, we we put it. Uh, with I was thinking with more equipment. for programming, guard equipment, maybe anything sure. you have for swim lessons. I think that's that a good comment. Yeah. I also had two other questions, but they were more on the uh, pool design. If this is the time. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. If I need to. We still have a lot of information to get through on the survey and public input on these four, so I might say we sure. should hold questions now so we get through the information. But okay, mm -hmm. that would be fine. Yeah. And with that, we're going to move to Danny to just talk about open house number two, and then Laura will talk about survey. Yeah, thanks. You know what, this one is real quick. It's one slide. Uh, so what you just went through with every one of the four designs, the corresponding list of items, that was placed on easels in a room and we invited the public to come and talk with us about it. So the second open house was much simpler in its concept because we wanted to reserve the time to talk to the public. We've got some of the different points that folks had, but most of the participants that came had a lot of questions about lap swim. So, uh, um, we tried to do our best to answer those questions for them and understand the pros and cons of the designs. And uh, with that, the open house happened at the very same time that the community was being asked through that um, community-wide survey. And so Laura's going to share more about those survey and the results there. Thank you so much, Danny. Good evening, thank you so much for uh, having us this evening. Again, I'm Dr. Laura Payne, and I'm a professor and extension specialist at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And we're really grateful to be a part of this project, something that is evident to me uh, since beginning to work with you all on this project is that City Park Pool is such a special place that is beloved by the community. I grew up uh, in a community going to the pool, swimming, lifeguarding, the whole shebang. Uh, and so I, I understand what a special place that is. <clears throat> Um, our role was to coordinate the community survey that occurred, and uh, what we did was, let me, eh. oh, thanks. Well, Apparently I'm challenged with technology you, this evening. Click here. Okay. Thank you, Julie. Actually, it's not working, so just hit it. <laughs> okay, all right, we're going with, we're gonna go with enter this evening. In any event, <clears throat> so we conducted a community-wide survey uh, that began in February and concluded about March 8th, and I'll talk a little bit about the questions that were asked, <clears throat> um, the survey methodology, and what the results were. As you know, there are a little over 30,000 households in the city of Iowa City, and what we did was we uh, drew uh, a subsample from those 30,000 households of 6,000 households, uh, and they were asked to complete an online survey, as I said, in late February to early March. This was a stratified random sample and the questions on the survey assessed interest in the four pool designs, programs and activities, and we also assessed demographics. When you see 6,000, is this the survey that you send out or this is the people who respond to the survey? 
six, good question. Uh, 6,000 households were randomly selected to receive a survey invitation through this postcard in the mail. So we mailed a postcard with a QR code and a link to the online survey. There was an unforeseen issue with the English QR code that was inoperable, but the other four QR codes worked. A second mailing was sent five days later with a fixed and usable QR code. Uh, the survey was still available during this time to all the residents via the public access QR code while the second mailing was in production and there was no measurable effect uh, of that <coughs> unforeseeable issue uh, on the response rate uh, to the survey. And you can see here an example of the postcard. Some of you may have actually made it into the stratified random sample and received a postcard in the mail or two postcards in the mail. The survey was available in English, Spanish, French, Mandarin, and Arabic, and we had some responses uh, across those various uh, various language surveys. The sample was stratified by race and ethnicity, so we wanted to make sure that people from diverse racial and ethnic groups were oversampled. Stratification of the of the sample on the front end involved ensuring that the random sample of 6,000 households closely, as closely as possible, reflected the race and ethnicity of Iowa City households. Because there is research, lots of it actually, that indicates that people from different diverse groups, like Latino and Hispanic and African American slash black households, are significantly less likely to complete mailed surveys. So it's important to oversample those groups to ensure that the sample, that the respondent sample actually closely reflects the population of Iowa City. There were a number of survey questions, but we stayed focused on the primary purpose for the survey, which to, was to assess interest in the four different pool designs. So first, respondents were asked to submit or to, to select, to submit, to write out their zip code and their address to ensure they actually belonged in the stratified random sample. So that was like a way for us to cross check. We asked about pool use frequency, the days of the week people, people in their household are most likely to use city park pool, activities that people, in their, people themselves and people in their household engage in at city park pool, and we also included several demographic questions relevant to the purpose of this community input survey. And you can see an example from the, the survey right here. We asked for people to weigh in on their preferences for pool designs A, B, C, and D. And the question as worded was, how interested are you and members of your household in seeing, for example, option B as the final design for the replacement of city park pool? These were measured on a seven point scale where one equaled very uninterested to seven equaled very interested. We also asked people not only to tell us how interested they are in the four different pool designs, but also ask them to rank in order of, you know, their preference, top, the top one being one, to the fourth one being the bottom, uh, for all four pool designs. It's important to note that for every respondent, they were given the order of the pool designs, A through B, in random order. So every single respondent received a random order, and that's to remove bias um, from, from the whole process. In terms of response rates, uh, so out of the 6,000 addresses from that stratified random sample, uh, 1,400 of those households had either moved or had a, or we had some returned mail. This is not uncommon for a college town like Iowa City where you have a, 
you know, people moving in and out of the community at certain times. The response rate was 9.8%, so almost 10% response rate, which is excellent. And the total number of valid surveys from that stratified random sample is 449. This ensures that we have a 95% confidence level uh, that we can confidently say there is plus or minus 5% or less error in the responses, which is very important for the validity of the findings. Let's talk a little bit about uh, what the sample looked like in terms of demographics. The mean age of the sample is 38.2 for the stratified random statistically valid survey. The standard deviation is 15. So what that means, in case you're interested, is that, uh, is that on average, people were about within about, you know, oh, young, you know, young adults between, sorry, I'm not explaining this well. Uh, they were 15 points above or below 38 years old. And that's how closely the age of the sample clusters around the mean. I should have made you a, rand, uh, a normal curve to demonstrate this, uh, to, to show this visually. Uh, the gender, most of the respondents uh, reported to identify it being female. This is very common for household surveys. I've done probably 30 plus of these in my career. And more often than not, you have 67 to 85% who are the female head of household who are filling out the survey on behalf of the household. We had, the age spread was pretty broad with, you can, you can see that uh, you had a pretty good number of folks who are between the ages of 19 and 29, about a third, 30 to 39, about 20% middle-aged, about 26%, and then the, the 60 plus age group was about 12%. In terms of race and ethnicity, the sample fairly closely reflected the race and ethnicity of the city of Iowa City. So what you have on the left is based on the American Community Survey, the most recent data from the American Community Survey, which shows the racial breakdown of the community, and on the right is our sample. So for example, uh, our sample was a little lower, 1.5% uh, white, whereas Iowa City is 74, about 75% white. Our sample was 11% Asian, whereas Iowa City is 7.7%. Our sample, is 1.2% African American slash black, whereas Iowa City's is 8.1. So that was the only one that we really kind of weren't close in there. And our sample was 5.2% Hispanic slash Latino, and Iowa City's is 8%. I should note that 8.6% of the respondents preferred not to answer this question. So we'll, we won't know, we, we don't know we can't know, you know, if, uh, if some of these categories were bumped up a little bit higher because they preferred not to answer, okay? All right. Looking at the spatial spread of responses, you can see how, where respondent, respondents came from within the city of Iowa City, and it's pretty widely distributed across the different areas in town, which is also another indicator of how uh, closely the sample actually represents the community of Iowa City. So that's, that's a good thing that it's spread out like that. In terms of one more demographic, and then we'll get to the good stuff, which is I know you're all waiting for. Uh, the de in terms of children under the age of 18 in the household, more than two thirds of respondents indicated they do not have a child under the age of 18 living in the household. And so this is fairly consistent with the actual age. Mean age, if you look back at the mean age being 38, so you've got younger adults and, you know, I wouldn't say older adults because older adulthood keeps getting pushed back. Um, I study aging, so I know about these things. But uh, you have a lot of people who have older kids, kids out of the household in college or, uh, you know, just out of the household for part of the year. Then we asked about uh, how often people, how often people themselves and members of their household 
actually visit City Park Pool. And almost half of the sample indicated they visit the pool one to three times per month, followed by 19% who indicated they are non-users of City Park Pool. 18% visit once per week, 10% two to three times per week, and 8% four plus times per week. In terms of activities, the number one activity reported by respondents that they like to do, or that they are doing, is generally open swim. So that's the most common activity, followed by sunbathing, uh, lap swimming, and then fitness, using the wading pool, other activities and water walking were also reported, but less frequently. All right, here we go. Drum roll, please. Just kidding. Uh, the interest levels of each pool design. Most respondents indicated they were interested in seeing pool design A being developed. There was also strong interest in pool design B, as you can see from the chart. Only 23% of residents or respondents were interested in seeing pool design D, uh, you know, moving forward with that one. The data was also consistent uh, when we asked about the rankings, pool rankings. So remember, they were asked to rank their pool design preferences A through D, you know, one being their top preference, four being their bottom preference. Nearly 50% of respondents ranked pool design A as their first choice. The second most popular was pool design B with 22% ranking at first, and pool design D was consistently ranked last. At the end of the survey, there was an open-ended question which invited respondents to share any other additional views on City Park Pool that they have. And the open-ended open feedback is really aligned nicely with the first round of community input that Danny talked about, which where people were really engaged in activities and brainstorming and voting for different options. They also voiced their interest in particular infrastructure needs and preferences, such as a heated pool, more shade, play features, and 25 and 50 meter lap lanes. Family friendly play areas were mentioned as well. That included play features, child friendly spaces, and as one uh, respondent said, a more inviting pool for all ages and activities. Over and over again in this sample, people noted how much City Park Pool means to them and their families. I think that's important to note. And there's a, there's a strong interest and desire for separate lap lanes that have lane lines. That was that came out loud and clear as well. Zero depth entry is very important, and many respondents commented on their preference for pool design A. So as you can see, this is, this is all kind of lining up and pretty consistent with what you've heard already. So in, in conclusion, overall, respondents indicated the highest interest in pool design A. There is moderate interest in pool design B. Uh, there's much less interest in pool design C and D, with respondents being the least interested in pool design D. I should say, uh, I'll spend a minute or two on the results from the publicly accessible, the public survey, the open survey, as it's been referred to, that anyone else in the community was invited to participate in and you know submit their input. And similar results were received from the open survey and we had 1,133 valid responses to that survey. So just a little bit on that open survey and what the findings were. And you'll see how they mirror um, the stratified random sample, which is another form of triangulation and ensuring the statistical validity of the, of the survey findings. So as I mentioned, the open survey had 1,133 valid responses. And we had some responses from people who preferred to take the survey in Spanish, French, Mandarin, and Arabic. The age and gender of the open sample. So the age of this open sample was a little bit higher. You remember it was 38.2, I think, for the stratified random sample and a little bit higher. But the standard deviation is about the same. Uh, the gender lines up pretty, pretty, pretty well there, pretty consistent as well along the same lines. And how did, you, how did you conduct the survey? The first one you mailed it. 
What about this? Yeah, this one was available. This one was avail this one was made available through social media, through uh, announcements. What else, Julie? Yeah, so this one <coughs> this one was available online for anyone who wanted to fill it out. We did all kinds of press. We did um, outreach to our partner groups, everyone we could think of to let people know that the survey was available. So it was just open to anyone to go on and, and do that. And I, w I want to say that the staff um, did a marvelous job of, with their community outreach because for such a high, this is a very high response rate. I've done several of these pool surveys in different communities around the Midwest, and this is a really high response rate um, compared to some of the other communities that I've worked in. So they did a great job of reaching um, a variety of different uh, residents in different neighborhoods and areas and things like that. Good question, thanks. Uh, the, in terms of race and ethnicity, it, it, it mirrored the stratified random sample pretty closely as well. And then if you look at interest levels for each pool design, they're almost exactly the same, right? Um, most respondents indicated they were interested in pool design A with a little bit more folks in the open survey interested in pool design B and only 35% of respondents were interested in seeing pool design D be developed. So these are very, they mirror each other very nicely. So in overall conclusion, um, both samples, the open survey and the stratified random sample, overall respondents indicated the highest interest in pool design A. There is a moderate interest in pool design Z, B, excuse me, and there is much less interest in pool design C and D, with respondents being the least interested in pool design D. And now I'll invite Frank up and he'll uh, talk about recommendations. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Frank Parisi. I'm the managing principal at Williams Architects, and I have the privilege of closing us out. Hopefully we'll make it in enough time to actually get to your council meeting overall. Um, I think there's enough information that was presented uh, from Laura's survey as well as some of the conceptual designs at Andrew that um, our recommendation, uh, one of the recommendations is actually to go to option A as the recommended option. Um, that's basically based on all, the, it achieves all the project goals that we've established for the project. It meets all of the uh, community need and criteria that was established in the survey and actually in the public engagement as well. So close to that uh, particular option, these are actually the, is the same design that Andrew had presented to you. Um, overall, uh, with regards to the, the, the usage, uh, we believe it actually uh, accomplishes all of those uh, all those goals that were set at the initial that uh, Julie had established with us and meets all of the patrons' needs as well. Uh, one thing we also wanted to share again um, was uh, consideration for option B. Uh, from the same criteria and operationally, this is uh, as sustainable operationally as option A, gives the best flexibility flexibility operationally to the city as well with regards to that. Um, so they all meet the patrons' needs as well uh, with regards to that. Um, Dr. Payne actually had referred to uh, questions that we had gotten uh, during the open survey portion, and I think one of the council members had asked that about the two lanes, and what we wanted to do is actually show the opportunities here for additional considerations and show them how they would impact the design um, overall. One thing that actually was brought up, you know, can we revise uh, six lanes to eight lanes on the 50 meter? Uh, either one of those options can do that. Uh, it would add up approximately $850,000 to the uh, cost that we presented previously to the project, um, as well as adding, obviously, increase in operations because of the increased volume to 75, approximately about 75,000 gallons. One thing we, we want to point out, because we were so sensitive to the um, contextual park setting as well. If you did move a little bit to the east, we would actually have to move the existing fence line out to accommodate those additional lanes. So there would be a little bit of an impact on the east side to the trees and the playground that is there uh, with regards to that. Operationally, we also like to take this into consideration because of the larger uh, volume of pool in that particular aspect operation, you do have to add more lifeguards to actually guard that as well. The other I think that came up initially um, with regards to the discussion was, uh, which Danny had mentioned, was the opportunity to do a 25-yard lane swim 
um, with regards to that. And there's a couple different options that we can actually do that with. Uh, one thing that we can do, I think Commissioner Alter had mentioned this, um, we can actually provide a, a rope at the halfway of the 50 meter. Um, and of course, um, uh, the projected operational model that I think Julia and her staff is considering is to actually have, and I know Andrew may have not have mentioned this, is to actually have dedicated lanes open all day, which would increase the lane usage for the 50 meter. And then by operationally moving the buoys around, you can actually get uh, 50 meter lanes as well to actually uh, address the short course lane that is needed, all right? So that would be within e either one of those options by just moving the buoys around. Obviously, there's no additional cost with that other than operations. The other way to do that is actually the deep hopper that we've shown in both of those options, you can actually increase the length of that deep hopper to 25 yards, and then you can actually separate the long course swim, open water, and then operationally, you can switch between diving activity or uh, yeah, diving activity to 25 yards, you can actually have a dedicated four lane 25 yard if you were to extend the deep hopper a little bit longer with regards to that. Um, operationally, that would actually add uh, dollars to the project, about $650,000 to that. And most of the water that is actually being increased in here is pretty much um, addressing the 25 yard option in the deep hopper, which would increase um, about 2,400 gallons to that operations. And as well as, if you noted, most of our deep hoppers were actually on the south side of the site. And if you would make that a little bit longer, it actually starts impacting the south fence line to actually make that bigger, to allow uh, the safe safety around there uh, with regards to that. So what we wanted to do um, initially is uh, kind of be stewards of your budget, the initial RFP did have a budget, and of course, as we're progressing through the community's needs, we did identify the community needs in each one of the designs with the preferred option as option A, but if there was a desired cost savings, there are uh, things that we can actually do, and that would be the, at the council's discretion here. Uh, we can exchange the current channel, that is an option A, with just a play feature in the zero depth, which is actually in option B. Um, Again, further consideration, if you wanted to reduce cost, um, we can reduce uh, lanes as well. And uh, last option we actually had was, you know, we can actually revise the layout, of course. Um, we're presenting options and our recommendations as professionals to the council based on our wealth of experience doing aquatics facilities overall. Uh, next steps, oops, I think I went straight to the thank you. Um, Julie had initiated this initially, so hopefully we've given you enough information to actually deliberate at the next council meeting. I believe it's two weeks from today uh, with regards to that. So if we do have approval at the city council meeting, we wanted to give an overall schedule where we would start design in June of this year and conclude in January. Um, always targeting to do bidding and contracts um, in the winter months, um, where in February and March we'd actually receive bids and make a come back with a recommendation to the board for those uh, solicited bids. And we would actually have a construction duration of about a year in which the pool would actually be closed uh, the season of 2025, which would be next season, uh, with a grand opening in May of 2026. Uh, I do want to thank everyone for your patience uh, this evening and uh, listening to our presentations. Thank you so much for engaging our team. We believe uh, we've had fun along the way, but hopefully we've given you enough information to actually make an informed decision. Thank you so much. <clears throat> thank you. I just want to, um, we have about eight minutes left before we're going to take a break. So we'll end on this topic for the work session and continue. So if anyone has any questions, now would be the time to ask. I have one quick question. Um, sorry, I just cut in. Go ahead. Oh, um, I just want to make a comment as you move through the details of the children's play area. I hope you can pay special attention to the noise ambience that is uh, affected by various play features or sprayers or stuff like that. I think one of the nicest parts of City Park Pool is that there is no sprayer features that generate a lot of like roaring noise and I can converse with my friends on the pool deck. If you go to the Coralville pool, uh, these commissioners and I could not even have a conversation sitting this close to each other without shouting. And so I just love that City Park, you just hear children playing and you hear birds and you don't hear like loud splashy noises from the water features. So I don't think we're down to that level of detail yet, but I hope you can keep that in mind. And I did have one question uh, relative to the, um, 
potential considerations for a 25 yard lane consideration. Um, with the deep hopper, you mentioned that if it were to be enlarged, that would have impact um, the south fence line and the trees. Uh, approximately how much are you, do you have an estimate of like what that would Probably be? Probably double in length. Double the length? It does not. It does not. Can you come? Yeah. You're not going to go back all the way to the yeah, front. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we 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 can remember in the option A how it's uh, 45 degrees. So you could actually just expand so it without. So we studied it, and you can if you just rotate it 90 degrees and more. move it, uh, move the main pool up. We can fit it. Just a little more. We can fit puzzle. it without removing um, mm -hmm. trees to the side. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. But you could get it so that you could enlarge the V hopper for. Yes. yes. Okay. For 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 trying to keep that footprint. You mean it's doable, but it's going to be cost effective? Correct. Cost is effective, yes. yes. It still increases yes. the cost. Let's do it. Can I ask a question about putting 25 meter lanes in the deep water? Yes. Does that meet the needs of people who want the 25 meter lane? Um, it can be designed as all deep, or it can be designed as would be if it was just a typical 25 yard pool, which means it would start at three foot six and slope down to, okay. to um, 12 foot six or 13 or 14 feet. So that could be a, a future decision. Um, you, so you could, have the, the, you could have the whole pool be <clears throat> at the same deep water or you could have it be a traditional lap pool which starts shallow and slopes deep. Yeah, I'm sure Julie knows more about this, but it sounded like some of the interest in the 25 meter lane was from people who are not strong swimmers and maybe then wouldn't want to be in deep water. But remember that the entire area of the 50 meter pool is the standable water. Yeah. So the swimmers, that would be where they would be. And then the other thing about if they're in the diving well, the lap lanes would be available as they are now during the mornings and the noontime swim, the 25 meter ones, in the, if they're in the diving well. Um, and then it would be diving during open swim. So just that. Clarification. I have two quick questions. Uh, <coughs> first off, with the input and the design, is the intent of the shade to provide shade for the lifeguards or for the patrons? For the bathers. For the patrons. For the bathers. Yeah. Okay. For the patrons. I just the way it was designed, some of them looked like they were on corners where it may have been intended for lifeguards. And you hear that a lot with staff. No, I think with the lifeguards, you can see the image that we have out there. There would be lifeguard stands okay. um, that actually cover the surface area, and then they would have their own shape. Great. Uh, other question I had is with the toy features, if you want the current channel or the play structures. Um, is there some sort of risk coefficient or anything being presented in in along those lines um, to kind of speak to one lifeguarding, but also what other cities or municipalities have experienced when they have that feature versus when they don't in terms of number of instances that may happen, accidents. We'd have to, we would have to pull all of our clients that have those features. Yeah. We haven't gotten to that level of detail in either one of them yet, no. I think that's worth looking into if we're trying to determine what the fun features are of it to look at those angles. If you recall, uh, Danny had presented this, so the interest from the public to actually hit an age group is Can you go to the mic? Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, so the play feature that we talked about from the play was actually not to treat it as a water park, but to actually handle the age group that would go from three to eight years old. So that would actually guide the design of that particular feature. Yeah, and I think that's great, and I like the options a lot. I think for what we choose, it needs to be considered both from the staffing standpoint and the potential of incidents to come, Agreed. which one we would go with. Appreciate it. Um, I had an observation that uh, in the, the existing pool, the open play area, open swim area, is, is quite a bit larger than uh, the, like the lap swimming and diving well, and it's sort of inversed um, in this design A and, and actually all the designs, um, at least as it appears uh, in these graphics. Um, but the, the preference from the community was that the open swim was the, the top need. So I just wondered if you could comment a little bit about like how you balance those, uh, the, the space allocation. So that's kind of been a common question we've gotten. So a couple <coughs> things to remember that with this, with the lap lanes being shown, they're all shallow in this case. So you would have ability for open swim to go the entire length of the 50 meter. So that gains you some space with the current pool. 
you know, we go into the deep water, but a lot of it is the diving boards at the end. Um, so the idea would be there would be two to three designated lap lanes, but the rest of that would be available for open swim anytime we're in there for open swim. So I'd let them comment more about the spaces on that, but that's an operating question that we've got asked. Operating question we've got asked several times. <laughs> And I would just add to that to say that um, all of the designs for the leisure pool portion, and I mean by leisure pool, the portion with the zero depth for the first three options, um, we did try to design those pools so that there is a good size three foot to three foot six area for open water um, to allow for that swimming and wading experience. We know sometimes feedback we've gotten from designing pools over many years is that if there's too much too much, zero, too much of a good thing, too much zero depth, or too much shallow water in, in, the, in the zero to one foot range that it, it's not well used, and you kind of miss the, the middle age uh, kid demographic. So we, we did try to designate that um, to have a, have, a, have a middle depth waiting area in, in A, B, and C. I had a question for you, Julie, probably. Um, I noticed that with the additional lanes, which I appreciate having those numbers available to look at, um, it says will require additional lifeguards. I wasn't sure how many additional lifeguards, and yeah. if you could give us a sense of what the annualized cost of a lifeguard is. Ooh, $15 an hour, <laughs> okay. 40 hours a week, uh, eight to 10 weeks of summer, so you could do the math real quick on that for each one. But um, going from the six to the eight lanes just widens that pool. So whereas if you're at six lanes, you could probably have two lifeguards on that pool if it was a standalone. Once you go to eight, then you're probably closer to our current configuration where you put one on each of the corners. So it's, it's probably two extra lifeguards. That, it all depends on the amount of swimmers and how they're being used. I think options A, B, and C would all operate at the same or less lifeguards as what we have now. Uh, actually D since it's the same. Um, the more water space that you add, the more square footage, the more you spread it out, the more we have to give staff more, you know, more staff uh, lifeguarding stands to cover the water space. It's, it just comes and down to And how many geometry. lifeguards we have now? We what? have eight, uh, now we have eight currently. How yeah. many lifeguards do we have? Lifeguards total? Per shift. Yeah. Per shift. Ooh, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. Sorry. But are it going to be more than that or the same because yeah. you, we're reducing it because we don't have those two lanes? Yes. Yeah, so and in, if in have terms of lane. lifeguards, uh, you know, the larger, so if you were to go eight lanes plus the separate diving well plus the separate, you're probably talking more lifeguards than we have right now. If you keep the lap lanes more in a, at a right size of, of six, you can do it with less lifeguards for that. The diving well stays smaller, you need like one lifeguard. If we go bigger, you're going to need two. There's lots of trade-offs here as we talk about all the different trade-offs of what we're going to do. Um, as staff, we're just looking for flexibility so that we have options going into the future that we have a pool that we can act, you know, staff in the long term. So there's gonna be trade-offs with any of these, any of these options for sure. We're gonna have that be our last question. <laughs> So thanks to all of you for presenting today and thanks to the commissioners for joining us. And we're gonna um, go into recess um, and come back after the formal meeting. Three months it is now, May 7, 2024 and we're gonna <laughs> reconvene our work session. And the next item on our agenda is item number two, which is to discuss our city's utility discount program. All right, so turn it over to you, Jeff. Yep. Uh, there are a couple of memos in the packet I just want to call your attention to. Uh, it'd be IP3 in your May 2nd packet. Um, the first memo uh, is dated May 2nd. It's uh, from me and just gives a little bit of history on the utility discount program. Uh, it was originally created in 1979 and uh, has been changed uh, a few times since then. Um, uh, it looks like in the 1990s, the council revisited this program several times, and the last uh, substantial change uh, that we saw was when we created our stormwater utility, we had to amend the program to, to include the uh, stormwater uh, utility. That was back in uh, 2004. 
Um, it also notes, uh, that memo notes just how the program has, has grown. We saw some, uh, we found some old staff memos from 1996. At that time, there were 92 um, rate payers enrolled in the discount program. Um, uh, back in uh, 2016, we had 370 enrolled. And uh, today, we have uh, just over uh, uh, 400 enrolled. That number can fluctuate uh, throughout the year as people roll on and roll off. So don't think of that as a static number, but generally shows you a trend line of growth in the program. Um, it uh, requires, the, the, the program requires a subsidy from the general fund. So general fund dollars are required to uh, pay for the subsidy. We cannot use the um, rate payer monies to, to cover uh, the subsidy. So um, uh, it's, a, it's a program that as of uh, today costs just over $100,000 um, with impact to the general fund. Um, at a previous meeting, there was commentary about our um, voluntary dis, um, uh, kind of uh, support the discount program. If you if you are a rate payer and you see on your bill, you can check a box and pay an extra dollar, extra five, ten dollars uh, per bill cycle. Uh, we do have a number of people that uh, generously participate in that, but that only generates about 11500 per year, so uh, just about 10% of the overall cost of the program. We will try to grow that program. We will try to market it based on uh, your feedback from, from the previous meeting uh, to get that number up a little bit, but probably not going to uh, reach the full uh, subsidy needed. Has that number been the 11500 been static? Do you know? Is it just? I think it at its highest, it was probably. Yeah. Yep. I think at its highest, it was maybe around fifteen thousand. I think probably when the, it initially rolled out and the biggest push, and then as people have moved away or whatever, it's just kind of slowly dwindled. Um, we haven't pushed it in the last few years because a lot of the push was, you know, to help supplement so someone's water wasn't shut off, but we weren't shutting off water for almost three years. So we weren't pushing out the discount program at that point. The uh, uh, second memo in that packet follows it immediately, and this is one that you had seen before as this issue came up in the budget uh, deliberation. So that one's dated January 31st. Again. It, uh, goes over all of the, the rate recommendations. It has a few sample bills in there and the impact of the rate increases on um, bill payers, both those in the program and not in the discount program, and also has some water rate comparisons that uh, we thought would be helpful at that time. So I'll just let you all deliberate, and, and Nicole and I, uh, Ron, are here to answer questions about the utility accounts as you have them. When someone makes a donation to this program, is it tax deductible? You'd have to seek your own tax <laughs> advisor for that. No, uh, I just don't yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I don't believe contributions to a local government are tax deductible, right? It'd have to be a foundation or a, a nonprofit, and mm -hmm. so I don't believe so. But I, again, no. I would consult a tax advisor, but that's what I believe. I, well, I, don't, I don't know if leaning into promoting this is the right methodology, but if we did, we could orchestrate a mechanism where we operated through a foundation, like the but community foundation, so that people could get that benefit and make me get some larger donations. But it's better to donate it to a number of the organizations who are helping uh, the, the low-income people with uh, paying their water bill. Uh, because it's going to be complicated even to a city to do it. So yeah. there is currently some number of the organization are doing this. So anyway, I, I really my concern on this is uh, that the it, that the discount is on the basic used, which is that's why you see here the increase of only 3.99. And uh, the, the, the basic uh, monthly use rate uh, for the first 100 <coughs> uh, cubic feet per month, I think it's just a uh, constant charge. But after that, everything was, will be like $3.97, uh, you know, cent per 100 cubic feet between, if the people spend between 101 to 3,000. So this is not reflecting the actual usage of the people who have, they are low income and have big families which is their water is not going to be $36 a month. Or after the increase, it's not going to be 37 
or would be more than that. And that's what might concern me. Mm-hmm. And, and the, the, still the, the discount is not going to apply to them. It will apply still to the 37 after the increase. Yeah, I, I appreciate that it's not like proportional, right? So as you use more water, you're not getting a bigger discount. That's what I saw. I kind of like that because it incentivizes conservation on the one hand, right? So if we can, like with our climate action team, helping people understand water conservation and know that that's one element that can lower the cost of that particular utility. I think for me, the really compelling part in the memo from January was just comparing to other cities. Um, You know, I think we do have I think we have really good water. Those of us who've lived in Iowa City for a long time know that it did not always used to be that way. If you ever go to Coravel and drink out of a drinking fountain or, you know, drink their water, much, much worse than (laughs) Iowa City's. The fact that it is as affordable as it is and that we work with folks. So we have the discount program, but also, you know, we've heard in the past few years about the payment plans and things that we do. Um, I think it would, like, when I'm helping clients who are overburdened with their their debts and what they're what they're trying to be able to survive right i think the increases of three or four dollars per month it's not nothing right it can be very significant for them but i I, you know if you look at sort of prioritizing what their expenses might be i think the city is a, a a pretty generous um creditor for lack of a better term, you know, that we work with people and that we provide a high value service for low cost for what that is. So I, I do appreciate what you're saying. And I understand that you would like to see a discount that applies, you know, to the, even as the increase uh, usage happens. Um, But I don't like the idea of sort of incentivizing just higher water usage, meaning, you know, you don't have to pay as much. So I, I think it's worthy of the conversation that we're having tonight. And I think any utility rate increase is important to talk about because we know it impacts people. But I'm okay with the, you know, sort of continuing on the path that we've been on, knowing this is an enterprise fund. We're not making any extra money off of it. Um, it is just self-sustaining, and it is the cost of producing this really high-quality water, and there's a discount. I really believe that, you know, I understand what you're saying, and I know that we have a very good water. I used to live in Coroville, too, and we have to buy the water to drink, and that's what costs some time, half the bill of the water. Mm. I understand that. But if we just can, like, collect the data on the people who are going to take extra from their budget for, to add to the water and everything else, that will reduce their budget that they use it to put food on the tables, to pay rent, to do anything. Maybe to you this is nothing, and to us this is nothing. Somebody like me, I can pay that. There is no problem. But for some folks, this is really a problem. And if the city can do like for those residents, just at the end of the day, they are residents of Iowa City. They are vulnerable. You can go and ask about the, how many people come and ask for the water to be paid, uh, you know, like to, to be paid for them by a nonprofit organization or the utility. In fact, today somebody called me and they said they, they're going to shut down their electricity, for example, because mm-hmm. they already shut it down and she couldn't find anything because the program, the hiccup programs, uh, Six days ago, they closed the winter, you know, incentive for mm-hmm. the electricity. And she been going around and asking if somebody else have. There is many people like this, and and that's why I want to see like little increase. Even we don't have to do a huge increase, but I want to see like more instead of like twenty dollar discount, to be more than that overall. Now for the, because I mean, like when I say $20, this is overall mm-hmm. estimate for the sewer and for the, like the garbage and everything is not only the water. And I think uh, when I was talking about this earlier for not increasing the water, I just thought like everyone like open to the discussion to, to look into this 
and we should subsidize our people. I don't think so. this is going to benefit the resident, which is the taxpayer who are paying, you know, to operate this city. So I don't know. One one question I have is related to um, what are the funding sources that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to turn the, take this off. <laughs> Anytime I wear it, it doesn't work out. Um, <laughs> what, are the, what are the sources of funding out there that people can go to right now if they have issues with their water bill? Um, and, and is the city having a direct contribution to any of those entities? So... I know that we um, contribute to like community. Are they one of the entities that have a discount or like funds available for water? Do we know? I know Hiccup has some time. I know the general assistant has, but I don't know community. Yeah, so if someone comes in, right, unable to pay their utility bill, there is a sheet that the revenue staff has that has, I think, four or five different places. Community is one. Uh, Johnson County Human Services, HACAP, and Shelter House all have programs to help with utilities. So they are giving, given that information of where they can seek assistance. I don't know if that a current accurate thing, because today we was calling everyone to help this person about her electricity and the only uh, place available is general assistant like hiccup said go to the humans uh, like general assistant and uh, community crisis center said god i am the one who was doing that call with her i don't know you know, I don't know if your information is accurate right now. Well, Maybe it, they it, used to have something like that. The information may be accurate, but whether they have the, the funding they, they available run at, the, out of fund. at a current time, they may run out during yeah, a Yeah, that's a why I said yeah. currently it's not accurate, but they, they run out, right. you know. There is many things that the good resources here, but not, not like all around the year, because people have certain help for this, yeah. and they will run out. And when you see, like, the money, the people run out of money, that means the need is great. And that's one of the things that I'm really talking about here. One of the, the reason I asked that question is because it seems to me if there is, you know, if there's an individual or family or whatever that need the utility, need additional assistance, that there is an opportunity for them to get that um, somewhere. We heard, um, you know, from Councilor Burgess, you know, talking about like, you know, everybody is at this baseline, which there are some positives to that, although it is very true that there are some individuals that need um, more equitable help, which would might require them to have more. So that's where my interest is, is do we have the right partners or well, not the right partners, but with our partners out there in the community, do they have all the funds that they need? Of course, they'll probably never have all, but is there an opportunity that we can kind of seek to, for that for that portion that come to us that say, you know, I, I can't even afford, you know, the bill right now, even with the discount. So that's where my interest would probably go towards. Um, certainly if there's an opportunity that we can have for, you know, if 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 the I heard Mayor Pro Tem say, you know, let's increase it from 20. You know, is there another layer that we can <clears throat> attach, you know, locally, and we don't get into like all the partnerships <laughs> and stuff. So, I, I do understand the challenge, and I do think um, there are ways that we can find a solution that. It may not be the magic bullet, but it would help families in our community. How many people, they, you said they participating on the program currently? 411. 411. We're not talking about a lot of people still. So one question I have is, um, I don't know if this is opening a can of worms or not, but I know that we were able to use ARPA dollars for evic eviction prevention. We partnered with Shelter House and they're administering that. Um, 
and we've been really good stewards of allotting our ARPA dollars. Do we have any that has not been spent yet that we can we put towards this? Because does that still does that qualify? Would this ugh, you know what I'm saying? Would this qualify for ARPA dollars? Could we use some ARPA dollars to sort of bolster this fund up? It's a stopgap, I recognize, and I don't want to start playing fast and loose with stuff, but this is, you know, it, to Mayor Pro Tem's point, it is a smallish number of people, and yet the need is there. Is this something that we could divert some ARPA dollars in the same way that we moved very quickly and very um, effectively in helping Forest View people with their direct? Yeah. Right? So, so could we do that with something like this? We... Uh, when we weren't shutting off water, we, uh, there were a lot of unpaid balances accumulated. And early on, we used uh, $676,000 to erase those fund balances right, right, that, that right. were never paid. So we, we have never. committed 676000 uh, in there. ARPA dollars. Uh, you do have... Um, uh, we're just reviewing the the quarterly report, getting it ready for you today, so it's it's handy here. Uh, we're still working on two of the the Schmid um, grant agreements, um, and we're still working on the affordable housing piece, and we're still working on the skate park piece for uh, ARPA. The rest is in a kind of pending, uh, already tied up type of of state. So yes, you you could redirect that um, from one of those categories, but it's short term but that's temporary that's not going to be sustainable for long term no we, but if can sorry. i just ask a, a overall like i i'm a little bit uncertain what kind of like the policy question underneath this is right because we we know that the need far exceeds our ability to help those who are most vulnerable we know that the need far exceeds the nonprofit community you know organizations uh capacity to help those who need it the most. Um, I'm a little, I, I think we're getting a little off track when we're talking about making incremental changes to a discount program that impacts 411 residents. I think if we're going to have a conversation about like what what is our, you know, as the mayor always says, we, if we start at the end, what are we hoping to accomplish and what are the policies that we can influence to drive that? Because I think this is a, a bigger issue of people's basic needs not being met. And we know what, we know how dire our financial position is compared to what it has been in the past. And every meeting we come back and say, we should fund this more and we should fund, I mean, just tonight, right? Like, oh, we're just going to increase the uh, whatever funds. And it's really hard for us to, I think, keep our eye on really what I believe, you know, is our role, which is looking at the entirety of the community and trying to push policy to improve people's lives. And I'm not saying this conversation can't do that or isn't doing that. I'm just saying that I'm a little lost as to what we're, where we're headed. Uh, I have another question. The, the 3.99 increase that we have, this is still going to be increase on the basic only, right? Correct. The framework for the utility discount program. No, no. I'm, I'm, the, the increase that we are doing right now. It's... I'm is not. it per cubic or for the basic? It's a percentage. It, it's just a it's a percentage across the board. Let me pull up that memo. And so I think the memos are based on examples, right? So yeah. if you were using 800 cubic feet, it would be a monthly increase of a total of three dollars and ninety nine cents. Correct. No, if we use how much? 800 cubic feet. Which is fall on that second, like for like three point nine seven per cubic feet, like. I'm not following. Yes. I'm sorry. It's the, the dollar, dollar amount. amount. The three point. The eight eight hundred cubic feet is generally what we would say is an average household's usage. That's where the eight hundred. Because comes from. I have I have this and from the water department, and and this is say like uh, the first one hundred cubic feet is just a monthly charge, which is the minimum. But like 101 cubic, two, 3,000. 
to 3,000 is 3.97 per cubic feet, per, per 100 cubic. <coughs> and after that, like over 3,000, it will be $2.85, like when the people consuming more than 3,000, the amount will be less, per 100 <coughs> cubic feet. That's what I mean. Yeah, just to, just to clarify, the, the rate increase hits both the fixed and the, the first 100 and the variable, correct? So yeah. it's 3%. It hits, it hits every single piece of that, that all increases by 3%. Right. Every single layer. Each single layer increase. Yep. Uh, yeah, that's what yeah. I mean. It will be so like a lot on those people still because the rate would change due to the increase. Are you proposing to come with a solution for this and to add more discount for the people who are enrolled in this program? I, I think something that might be helpful before we do that, potentially, um, I'd be really interested to see what the additional efforts to publicize the, the program would do. Um, whether that results in you know more people contributing voluntarily to that fund or or other things, um, I'd just be interested to see what we can get out of that personally. And I think we can track that, right? We can say at this point in time we did this PSA push and social media push, and you know I think we can do it very low resource from the city mm -hmm. and then see after X number of months has the public contribution to that grown or not and if that's not effective. To what? I, I don't get that. So the individuals in the community can donate towards the fund that is part of, only about 10%, but is part of the subsidy. So we subsidize the program 90% from the general fund and about 10% of that currently or historically is from donations from the public. So if we want to increase the capacity of that program, if that's ultimately what we're trying to do, then I think we need to market it and market the fact that people can donate to it and, and see what happens, because I think most Honestly, I think the vast majority of people don't know about it. I didn't. Yeah. And just see. And we have two staff people in the room, so it's not like the community is watching this meeting. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I think that's great to you know to you know try to do this big campaign for this opportunity. I don't know that that changes. The request, <laughs> at least from. I guess I'm not sure what the request is. It's the flip yeah. side of, of that. If what? people need additional resources to help with their bills by putting out, and it, I don't know that it would be a big campaign, it could be a relatively mm -hmm. low lift campaign, but it could get pushed out fairly easily, then there would be more money in the program to help the people who need it. Mm -hmm. Is, it's, it could, it's, it's it could the increase. Two that sides way. of yeah. the coin. And can we, before, uh, while we're doing that, even if we agree to do that, and while we're doing that, can we freeze the increase for the people who participate in this program? Uh, no. No. Mm -mm. We can't. That would be a discriminatory rate and it would be illegal. And okay, can we, then we need to do change the discount program so it's not going to be is discriminating. And, and just. I want to make sure we're all on the same page. The discount program that we're talking about, staff, please check me, but I'm reading directly from the memo, is a 60% discount on water and sewer, a 60% discount on stormwater, and a 75% discount on refuse recycling and uh, curbside organics. And the minimum use with, with the caveat, the sixty percent water wastewater hits on just that minimum. That thirty charge. some dollars, Meaning, right? Yeah or $29, whatever it is. Yes, and I understand. So it doesn't scale up as people use more, and we need to incentivize conservation. So that that's my, that's where I kind of try and balance the different factors. Like, I mean, like a low income of uh, a family of one person uh, who are 
paying $37 for their water. And a family, a low-income family of eight, of course, they are using more water. I understand that when Korea is not using the more water, but those are family of eight. They need to use the water. I think. I, and I their think bill will be. Higher. I'm saying I disagree with you as to the as to the why. I'm not disagreeing with the underlying facts that bigger families are going to use more water. I absolutely exactly. agree. Exactly. I, I went like the same discount this person will get is the same discount the family with eight will get because basic on the basic used, like that the, the, the percentage is basic. Based I, on I, the basic use. I, I understand that. I'm just saying I disagree with what you're proposing. Oh, I hear fine. you. I hear you. Yeah, <laughs> it's not it's not like something new. So every. I, I do wonder. Oh, sorry. Go right ahead. No, I just mean like I'm not expecting. I'm I'm not even optimistic. I have a, a couple of questions. Are we um, with this program? Are we turning anybody away? Are we able to? Is this because 411 not. is. The number of people who have who qualify. I mean, we're not turning people away because we're out of funds. Is that correct? correct. Um, and so, uh, are you also? I know you had mentioned something, uh, um, Mayor Pro Tem, about wanting to freeze the rate, uh, which isn't. It doesn't sound like something we can do. Uh, but are are you also thinking about even though it affects not the discrepancy in user rate, but but the sixty percent number, uh, an increase to that percentage, which would help everybody across the board. And while it wouldn't be proportional, it would still bring a bill down. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, but why why should we increase it for somebody his his bill is only $36? And if we increase the 60% to, uh, like, for example, 70% or 80%, it's still we... Like we are losing as a city more for the people for their bill is thirty six, but we are not helping the the people. It's still the, the amount is the same. We are not helping the people who are consuming w more water, who don't qualify for the program. No, no, the people who are qualified. We're just talking for about the, the four hundred and eleven people. Or yeah. whatever that number. No, four hundred. Yeah, and by the way, also I was trying to bring something else. Uh, there are some people are not qualified, even though they are low income, because the qualifications is you have to have one of the like food stamp or uh, Medicaid, or you have to have like another program that will prove you are low income. There is some people in this community they are not eligible for those kind of things, but it's still low income, and those people are there now. You know, uh, I don't know how to fix that. And, and, and this is a local fund. I think so we can figure out a mechanism to have like more people who are not qualified for these federal programs to still be eligible for this amount of money, uh, amount of like discount of this. I mean, like eligible for this discount. And we had that conversation during COVID, I remember, because, you know, we were talking, I mean, there were obviously different changes to the utilities at that time and the sort of moratorium on shutoffs and all of that. But I, I remember Dennis before <laughs> Nicole talking to us about, yeah, there are different ways that you could define eligibility and explaining why this made sense for that. I, th I think that is, you know, a conversation that we could revisit. I personally, I'm troubled by us expending the amount of energy that we are for 400 people and $3.99 $3 a month. I think if what we want to do is move the needle on people's quality of life, we need to be having different conversations. Like these tiny little incremental changes in the utility bill, not that they don't matter, they absolutely matter, but what is our job? I think our staff understands we want to help low-income people and we, as a principle of equity, as the mayor said, right? Equity means different people might get different things, right? We have legal limitations on that in terms of we can't discriminate based on. We can know, do it income. as a way. If that's the only issue, we can do it as a way. We can like like, but add something new to this discount program to give like more discounts. So, but, but like using percentage, maybe we can just do like a small percent. Well, and I think if if we want to make it legal, if that the issue, if if counselors want to pursue that, that's a thing. 
I personally don't. And so I'm just trying, I think right now, Mayor Pro Tem, I'm trying to like figure out where are we going? Where is this conversation yeah. going? What do you mean where is going? We're going, I, the same thing that you said, you just said is not, uh, we cannot do it because it's not uh, right to do it or it's not. I was saying that's one aspect. Not legal. Yeah. So uh, we can make it legal. There is many ways to modify the discount program so to make it legal. And at the same time, the discount is not going to be more than the additional cost of the, of the utility bill that we are assigning right now. So for myself, I disagree with making changes to the program at this time. That's where I'm at. Yeah. I don't know where other counselors are. No problem. <laughs> and it does... I mean, I'm, I, I'm trying to find it in the memo, but this was something that, I don't know whether this is apples and oranges, but it is another piece to consider in the way that um, our strategic plan talks about that in order to continue with a certain quality of our water and our programs, you know, that, that we would work through incremental rate increases so it doesn't become these large bumps up when there's like we absolutely have to do this and then that inequity becomes even greater. I realize that is not addressing your concern exactly, but I am sort of the flip side of how do we help with the discount program is not necessarily to put a freeze on these because that is equally only a temporary solution and it will make the pain greater later when we should have been doing these smaller increases as they were needed as opposed to constructing a freeze in order to stave off something and then having to pay for it later in more painful ways. So yeah. I in addition to that, I feel strongly that our water needs to remain incredibly high quality and it's going to cost us three or four percent more a year to continue to make incredibly high quality water and much in line with what Councillor Alter said is that means we need to do it two three percent a year so we can continue to provide water that people actually want because the worst situation would be we stop investing in our water purification our water purification systems get dilapidated old out of date and then we're stuck with a major, major cost increase for everyone. And I would rather just keep up with it and then really look at those programs that we currently have in place. And um, I, I, I. You mean 400 family out of 30 family, 30,000 family in this city, those are the ones that they're going to make because if we subsidize them, we'll make our quality of water less. If we freeze water for the entire city, we will make the quality of water less. I said in this, 400. In, 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 we can't do that. We've gone over that. We no, we can do that. We can. We can. Inform people and tell them we're giving them a different rate. We cannot do that. No, we said we can change this program. You know, the discount program. The discount program helping only 400 people. This is the people who apply, like participate on this program. Yeah. Is 400. Yes. And we are we gonna like make the program better to help them, and they are only for we are helping only 400 families yes. out of 30,000 families in this okay. community. So those are not gonna affect anything, I uh, think. Well, maybe I'm a, I thought one of the many proposals, because I'm not following them either, was that we would freeze water no. rate increases somehow, and I'm no. just solidly against I don't, that. No, so, I yeah, did not no, say that. that. Just, okay. No, I didn't say that, nobody said that. So I guess, because um, I, I mean, I, I hear a lot of conversations um, that have taken place so far, but there's not been a specific proposal of, I, I guess I did hear um, from Councillor Harmson where he said, you know, can we increase the percentage from 60 to 75? Is there, or I don't know if you said 75, but I didn't, didn't if give there a was a, yeah. It didn't give a number. I was just sort of like trying to, uh, to figure prove? out what was possible in, in, sure. in order to, if not completely meet the need. And, and I, what I hear is, maybe two paths 
One would be just an increase of the percentage, which, because it's a percentage-based thing, if we increase the percentage of the cost, it actually will increase the percentage of the aid sort of organically. But we could increase that percentage more, right? So if, if the aid is based on the percent of the bill, and we increase the size of the bill, the aid will go up a little bit. Um, but it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. The other thing is that, that uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem had brought up was the eligibility requirements. And if it made, you know, so there's two possible ways to move forward if we want to move forward. And, and, and I certainly there's probably other ones too, but as I sort of digest all of the conversation, either an increase of 60% up to 65, 70, whatever that number might be um, for the people that qualify under the current mm -hmm. system and or um, uh, looking at do we need more people eligible to get into the program, and if so, how do we do that in a way that it is equitable? So I think those are two different possible paths. They don't have to be both or either or. Um, but just as, as I process and synthesize sure. what I'm hearing, although certainly, or, or possibly that it's the, you know, we're talking mm -hmm. about an impact of, you know, a, an increase of 5%, maybe an impact of $5. I mean, I don't know. It's not. It's not. We're not talking about an entire water bill, right? So, so we are talking about. If it's that, in, I mean, I guess. I, I'm just saying, if, if we're looking for a way to get off of dead center, those are a couple right. of things that that I would throw out there as possibilities, not necessarily endorsing, um, but as potential, right? So I, I haven't had a chance to go down this path to fully no. think about these things. We're just kind of in the moment, but uh, but those would <coughs> seem, based on the conversation, possible ways forward. I mean, one of the things that I is. In, in hearing all of this, and I was the one who suggested, hey, maybe we can throw some ARPA dollars towards it, knowing it's a Band-Aid. But in thinking about it, from sort of backing out a little bit, I do think, like, how are we moving the needle? And it, it hit me as you were talking, Sean, about, like, well, maybe, you know, increasing that discount amount, right? Yeah. That's going to be how many dollars per household, right? $5 for the bill? Or what? I mean... I guess that's where no, I'm kind of wondering. I'm, I, I'm, 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 as a as a for instance, um, how much effort and thought and work is going into doing something that is so incremental? I'm not like Laura. I'm not discounting or trying to dismiss the very real impact <coughs> that families are are feeling. But I also think that. Is this going to move the needle enough to actually make a, a make a substantial difference it will. for them? It will. For low income people, any dollar is it saving. It will put like Ooh. food in their tables. I think so. I, I, I would go with, like really with seventy five percent. I can. I mean, I honestly, when I see the sixty to seventy five percent, I can support a seventy five percent. You yeah. know, in this across the board it doesn't have all these different numbers I can support that yeah because it's going to be from each one and that's what make different yeah. like from the I can I can support a 75 percent it's still off the basic um, I I think it will help individuals and families so yeah I think if I if I, my math is right that'd be about a 15 percent increase which would mean about a 15 to seventeen thousand dollar increase in because right now the program's running at about a hundred thousand right yes but and that, so that's for all you, you're just i mean the conversation's only focused on water right now right water okay. and oh, that's water. the hundred thousand yes. dollar covers the cost things. of this program hits all those utilities um, <laughs> that are on your utility bill so yeah i'm basically what it, my point was that seems affordable to me i mean in terms of our, our size of a size of what it, the increased cost to the program would not be exorbitant, but it might have. The 15% 15, 15 increase to us wouldn't be as big of a deal as the 15% decrease would be to the recipients. Mm -hmm. uh, in That's terms what of, I mean. Day-to-day -day impact it is kind of the way I'm thinking. Of course, I you know others might feel differently. Yeah. Do we have to direct city staff to maybe? Well, I think we that? have to at least have four counselors that would agree to a increase to 75%. I think before I would want to move on that, I would like a staff report. So I'd be comfortable with asking for a staff report on it. On what? But on the change, the impact, where the funds come from. I would say if we're going to make a change like this, 
we've had this discussion tonight and it would be more work and us revisiting this and taking up more of our time and energy taking away from all those other work session topics that are on our list if we want to increase the discount for those elements that are 60 percent to 75 percent i think we just need to direct staff to do that so they can make that change rather than creating more work for additional discussion we have three people saying that we need one more to say yes and uh, he was asking about more information and now you agree right then more than 75 okay percent so then we have um, the direction for staff to move the discount for the water and sewer to 75 percent we were talking about that we don't have storm i guess the storm water would also go to 75 percent it is 75 percent already right no, no, that's the 60% no, of the entire Which one is the 75%? The refuse, refuse recycling and organic. Okay, yeah. Yes, all of them 75%. So it would all go to 75%. You have a question. So are you talking about 75% of the minimum or 75% of, of the minimum. Of the minimum. Of the minimum. Of the minimum. In the simplest way. Stormwater is the entire because there is no minimum. Right, it's a flat okay. fee. Okay. All right. We're going to move. Any other discussion there? All right, we're gonna move on. We don't have clarification of agenda items, but we do have item number four, which is information packet discussions. We'll start with April 18th. We're gonna go to April 25th. We'll jump over to May 2nd. And we're at number five on our agenda. I, if I could have one, well, I could one do second. it after USG. <laughs> no. I want to revisit one of those items, but after USG. On, an IP, on IP. We'll, we'll put you on hold for a second before we go to information pack, uh, before we leave information packets. Yes. My apologies. I just wanted to circle back. Uh, I'm looking at the pending council work session item, which is IP4. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a little unclear from your discussion earlier tonight on the historic preservation incentives. Is, is, are you looking for something on your work session pending list on that? Or wh where does that stand? I know we have a lot of in the work set. A lot of things to be put in the work session. I think we need the meeting about prioritizing the work sessions. Like I would put that, I would put that <laughs> yeah. at the top of our work session list. Is like let's figure out what we're actually going to take on yes. and stick to it. Can I ask a question about the specifically the historic preservation? Is that something that it would make sense or we can do? I'm not even sure how this would work to kick that to the historic preservation commission, yes. like and and have them bring us, you know, instead of I mean I don't know I just mean because they're I mean. They're so well versed in this stuff, right? I mean, we, other than Councilor Mo, I, I don't. I, I know. I, I certainly wouldn't. My level of knowledge doesn't come anywhere close to that, or members of the commission. So, I, just a thought. I agree with you because I think they are the one who are directly involved with the historic position owner. Maybe they want to do a survey. Maybe after that, most of them they can say, "No, we don't need this," or something like that. If they, if they can, we can just make them the start point of like investigating this and come with proposals to us. Would be better than putting this in a work session. Yeah, whether whether you direct staff or historic preservation, you guys can can make that call. We'll, we'll react to historic preservation's recommendations should you go that way. Um, but I think some clarity in what type of incentives you want to create, because what I heard were two different things, uh, which was incentivizing people to landmark does it or to, to designate something historic and then incentivize people that already steward historic properties to maintain that I, I do think because we can't get into the, like the details mm -hmm. I think we have to put it on a work session so that the council can bring clarification as to mm. that direction well, Maybe, oh, yeah. I see Why? because you cannot go into Detail. Detail. We can right say now. what it. We can say with some specificity what it is we want to engage in the work session on. Oh, I, yeah, I, you can talk about the topic, but I think we're trying to. Determine. I don't know what the topic is, right. and okay. if it has a and if it has a financial right. impact, I'm going to say let's not add it at this point. Honestly, like, can we stick to the things that we've already committed to, and follow the strategic plan? 
and not keep adding things that are just going to cost more and put us in positions that we can't sustain. I think when we get to prioritizing what's on the work session um, topics, we can we can actually go into a little detail there. So I think we wait for that. We have it on the work session, and we'll because right now we really can't go into. There's things going into details. Okay. Yeah, and we can't go into details. So. We'll have it on the work session. We'll bring it up, like, what topics do we want to keep? And we'll go from there. All right? Am I good? Anything Thanks. else, Jeff? Or, yes. Actually, one thing on just on pending topics and the idea of sort of a, a meta meeting about prioritizing our priorities. Um, before we do that, maybe our homework all is to revisit and reacquaint ourselves with just go through the strategic plan just so that we can go ah that's aligned and that's not so that then we can have a, a when we actually get to that meeting that's just a suggestion great idea great thank you awesome we're going to welcome usg at this time <laughs> welcome matthew Hey everyone, um, it's an honor to introduce myself for the first time as city liaison. So I miss, right. I miss my Noah, but I'm ready to be one leader amongst many in our student body. So this is super exciting. Ava Martinez will be the new deputy. Their pronouns are they, them, and I'm super stoked to have uh, them working with me. They could not be here to introduce themselves tonight. So you'll meet them in the fall when they're back on campus. The new government, governmental relations team is going to be working much more diligently on our advocacy uh, in the upcoming administration. We have been working on an impressive platform that I'm pretty excited about. This includes, but is not limited to, codifying the local advo advocacy subcommittee in USG's bylaws, which Noah and I have dubbed as the city mini committee. Um, this, allows, <laughs> <laughs> this allows us to give some subcommittee members a chance to attend city council. So basically, they'll get an excused absence from their Senate sessions, and we'll be able to have basically special guests whenever they deem they want to come to city council with us. So yeah, that'll be really exciting. Um, we want to work to promote, to promote voting locally at all levels, um, locally and at all levels, and ensuring that campus is a safe place to demonstrate and exercise our right to assembly during what we feel is going to be a rough election season. Um, and then I do have a question. So it is my understanding that the city of Iowa City, and this might be a city manager question, that we have city staff that work on state and federal advocacy um, in some respects about what we need, like funding from the state, other resources, is that correct? Correct. Okay, um, I do want to at some point discuss maybe getting in contact with those city staffers and that team because USG wants to take a more active role in not just advocating for the student body but also promoting the city that we live in that facilitates our success. We want to make it clear that Iowa City concerns are unequivocally student concerns as well and I want to voice our support for the items that the community uh, needs to prosper. So when we go do our capital visit days and we do our state advocacy we want to also voice Iowa City collective concerns and that was one of my my idea is going into um, the new governmental relations team for this year because I, I had heard like talks here and there, bits and pieces about the city of Iowa City's legislative agenda, and I was like, well, what, is, what does that mean? How can we add to USG's legislative advocacy? So um, I look forward to hopefully getting in touch with that team and uh, including those in our advocacy. Um, all this, uh, along with what we already do, like lease gap, runner's guide, town hall, etc., will all be coming up in the next year. Um, and then also I'll be here over the summer. So yeah, you'll see plenty of me. Awesome. Thank you guys. Really Thank amazing. you. Thank you. And appreciate that. Yes. <laughs> all right. We're on to item number six, council updates on the side boards, commissions, and committees. Hearing nothing, we are adjourned. Have a good night. <laughs>